Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and we got an open panel tonight. The link to join is already in the video description. So our topic of discussion tonight is I'm sure everybody is aware of the terrorist attacks that happened in Moscow, Russia over the weekend in which multiple uh again we're going to be talking about some of the geopolitical ramifications of this and there's a lot of moving pieces so we still don't know fully what exactly has happened but we know that over 140 russians are killed and what we do know is that islamic isis took credit for it but we're not sure yet of a terrorist attack in which men with guns and um, attempted to set fire to a theater and kill as many people as possible as after being recruited on Telegram for the amount of 10,000 USD dollars. I believe it was like half a million rubles or something like that, which is equivalent to like 10,000 US dollars. People were willing to commit these atrocities of which four of the suspects that were directly related to these events are now in custody in Russia. So we're going to... In this opening monologue, I'm going to lay out what happened, at least what do we know, and there's a lot that we don't know. I was going to play a video of a gentleman who was just recently on the Alex Jones show on InfoWars, who is a, a broadcaster in Russia, and I wanted to hear his opinion. Um, I was going to play a clip of Putin addressing the incidents that happened and lay out uh, kind of the events at hand, and then we can open up the panel. So if anybody wants to join, again, the, pa the, uh, the panel is open. The link is already posted. Let me post it again for people here in the chat. If anybody would like to join the discussion tonight, we're going to be focusing on the events, theories related to it, and uh, some of the geopolitical ramifications. So I'm going to lay out who I think is behind it, which I'm sure you've already probably guessed. But for the suspense, at least, we will wait in just a few moments when I lay out my argument. And so if you would like to join, you can join the stream right here. 
there's the link to join the stream. So if you would like to join the open panel, the only request is obviously we're on YouTube. So when you are able to speak, make sure that it's TOS appropriate because things, uh, this is a very contentious topic and I'm sure certain people could say things that may or may not get it flagged. Shout out to Ivan. He's already backstage. God bless you, brother. And so before we get going here, um, just got to do the same old rigmarole. Um, first things first, if you'd like to support my work, one of the best things you can do is become a website member. You can do so right here. We got three different types of memberships of which I just uploaded a new video to the website for website members right here. It is on Christ is King. Some of you guys may know what's going on over on the app known as X now. And so I give my little overview of the Candace Owens fallout with Daily Wire and the instigation of the claim that saying Christ is king is now an anti-Semitic dog whistle. So interesting. Um, that is uh, a topic that I just posted. We got multiple uh, videos. Again, those are up for website members. So if you'd like to access some content that's a little bit more controversial, a little bit more freedom behind the paywall, you can do so with this link right here. Would greatly appreciate that. And if you want to join the fitness group, of which uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, we'll have our fitness meeting for the month of April. It's always the first Monday of the month. And we'll have a premium members meeting um, next Wednesday, next Wednesday as well. So if that's something you'd be interested in joining the private think tank, you can sign up for a $25 membership. Also, if anybody's interested in a one-on-one -on -one session, you can sign up with this link right here. Uh, that also be greatly appreciated, and we can dive into any topic your heart desires in a private Zoom meeting between you and me. And if you would be interested in sponsoring a stream, you can do so with this link. We have a stream that I'll be doing this week on, oh, my book's over here, doing research on the religion of nothingness. We'll be diving into Nishitani's uh, Buddhism and German phenomenology. And that should be a fun stream. Shout out to AC. God bless you, brother, and all the family. Hope you guys are doing well. And of course, you can support my work by uh, getting some merchandise over at the website or on YouTube. If you go, go on YouTube and click the store link, we got merchandise over there, of which I got some new designs coming. So we'll have some new merch coming out for the summer. And I'm going to add some tank tops and stuff out there so everybody can, all the ortho bros can show off their guns this summer. So uh, that is on that is on the on the way, and I also want to mention to everybody. Um, oh 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 oh, my bad. Uh, uh, mention to everybody that because of the generous support of Logan Daly and Marcus Antonio, we had surpassed our goal to add new emojis, and so I have added three more emojis today. And we have the AOC Crazy Eyes, I see is already a fan favorite in the uh, chat now. We got AOC Crazy Eyes, and we got two new Chad, the ortho Chad emojis. So we, uh, we need 46, 46 more memberships so I can add my final emoji, which is Yuval Noah Harari. So um, if you're generous, if, you're, if, if the nubs are present, we can get a nub wave going. I should be able to add the Yuval Noah Harari once we get about 50 new memberships. So we need we need 50 more, but enjoy the new emojis. You guys, those are some of the ones you requested, and they have been delivered. So thank you guys all so much. Again, a major thank you to Logan Daly and Marcus Antonio for your guys' support by gifting Codal Crew memberships here on YouTube. I know the chat has been very appreciative. And now we got more emojis and more on the way, more on the way. We just need more memberships. So, all right. Um, okay, so to open up today's topic, we're talking about the Russian terrorist attack. What do we know? We know that it happened at the Crocus City Hall. This is a theater and a band known as Picnic was getting ready to perform, of which um, there's going to be thousands of people present. I believe it was like 6,000 Russians were going to be present for this concert. And these unknown terrorists who ISIS has claimed, although, again, I have my own speculation. So who is behind the Russian terrorist attack? 
Well, ISIS has claimed ownership. However, who is ISIS? And my argument is that, and I'll provide some details here, that um, the CIA, the intelligence agencies, we know due to Julian Assange's leaks in 2016 that the CIA actually created the ISIS. And so let me just show you that real quick so you guys get what it is that I'm talking about. So here's an article from Inquisitor of two, in 2016, November 30th, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks new uh, cables bombshell ISIS created by the CIA. And so they related, uh, released the Carter Cables 3, and it highlights that Julian Assange explained that the year 1979 marked a pivotal moment in world history and that it was a wild year politically and in all other ways and in numerous countries saw assassinations, revolt, coups, bombings, wars of liberation, and political kidnappings. Aha. Uh -huh. A new WikiLeaks diplomatic cables that Julian Assange and his organization have released make re riveting reading and describe how the now Islamist terrorism and ISIS originally began through a project between the government of Saudi Arabia and the CIA when they created the Mujahideen force in order to fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan as the United States then perceived the Soviet Union to be their biggest threat. So um, what happened? Well. Here is a little bit of a BBC overview, which, again, you can't count what any of the Western media has, has been saying. Zelensky has already blamed the attack on Putin, which is a bit bit ridiculous, but on brand for Zelensky, on brand for Zelensky for sure. And so, um, as I mentioned, over 140 people have already perished. Uh, God rest their souls. Memory be eternal. And. I know I, I'm, my, our liturgy this past Sunday and all of our Lenten services, we've been praying since this attack for Russians and all uh, faithful Orthodox Christians around the world that may have been affected in any way. Now, of the four attackers, we don't have all the attackers and we don't know how many fully were there, at least from my understanding. But we have four of them and all four were fleeing into Ukraine based on the advice of the Ukrainian government to find safe harbor there. So who is behind Ukraine? Well, NATO, the United States, Britain, Israel. And I would suspect that those same intelligence agencies are the ones behind this attack. As the Kremlin has already highlighted, the U.S. gave a notice that Moscow may experience a terrorist attack within the next two weeks, but gave very ambiguous details upon the attack. And Putin has made mention that it sounds more like a a, a sort of uh, blackmail or a threat that the West issued at them, especially after these events have unfolded. So some people I saw online have been speculating that this was a false flag and no, nobody actually died and it was all fake. However, there's been videos and you can see the videos released. And unless all of that's fake, um, I have a difference of opinion. To me, it looks like it was a real tragic event. It was a real terrorist attack. And these men claim that they were recruited on Telegram, that they were looking for work, they're poor, they have no money, and they were willing to do these attacks for 10,000 USD. Um, they also, when asked how did they get the weapons, they said they were delivered to them by an unknown source. Interesting. So people from, at least a few of them we know were from Tajikistan, they were... Uh, labor migrants looking for work, poor, and were recruited through Telegram to commit these acts, had no access to the equipment, and it was dropped off by an anonymous source. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Hard to believe myself. And so um, this is a, just a little bit of an overview of it. Basically, everything that I, I've already explained to you is here. Um one of the interesting things that uh, Putin has also mentioned is that um, it's interesting that this Islamic terrorist attack happened during Ramadan. And right here we see where um, in last week, Vladimir uh, President Vladimir Putin said recent pro provocative statements by a number of official Western structures about the possibility of terrorist attacks in Russia resemble outright blackmail and an intention to intimidate and destabilize our society. So 
Putin has given a response, and I just want to play this so it can be part of our <coughs> of our open panel and conversation today. So I got a few clips of Putin. We're going to listen to those uh, to see whether you agree with him or not. Who knows? But I think it's useful. We're going to be talking about the situation to at least hear what Putin has to say about it. So here's the first video I want to play to you um, in regards to the terrorist attacks. And then we have another one when he talks about who he believes benefits from it. And so here's the first one. They were found and apprehended. They tried to escape. They were moving towards the border with Ukraine. And we have data that suggests that they were uh, about to be moved towards the territory of Ukraine by those in Ukraine. Our military services, our emergency services, everyone is, our investigators are working on finding out the orchestrators of this terrorist attack, those who gave them transportation, who uh, created, uh, who gave them weapons, etc. The investigative authorities will do everything to identify all details of this crime, but it's already evident that we face not, we face not just a uh, cynically organized terrorist attack, but a massive mass killing of civilians. These perpetrators, these criminals, went specifically to kill, to kill people, point blank, our people, our children, just like the Nazis that once killed our people during the war, they do the same. All the orchestrators, all those who are responsible for this crime will inevitably uh, be res found responsible. They will pay. We will identify everyone who stands behind these terrorists and they will pay. This is a strike against Russia. We know what terrorist threat means, and we expect that other nations that share our pain will cooperate with us and we will stand united against this common enemy, international terrorism, no matter where it uh, shows its ugly head. These terrorists have no nationality and there's only one future for them retribution and uh, oblivion. So we hear here, again, Putin references Nazis. And if you remember when we did a review of Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin, um, again, Russian history, the Russians are quite uh, rememberative of World War II and their battles against Nazi Germany. And we know that Putin was tying Ukraine to the Azov Battalion. Uh, people debate the extent of the Nazi problem in Ukraine, but he has noted that they do, in fact, still have remnants of World War II Nazis in Ukraine, and that basically what they're trying to do and the powers behind them are ultimately fascistic. And so this is where some people don't, I, I've seen Westerners are very critical of his continual usage of Nazism. I agree. Um, he, but it, for Russian history and the Russian people and Russian culture, it makes a lot of sense because uh, the Soviet Union fight against them is pivotal in their history. Now, here is a recent one. Also, um, this is two minutes. And this is what people are noticing that they believe he's actually talking about the U.S. deep state, the Obama leftovers. You know, many people speculate that the Biden administration is, in fact, Ob Obama's third term. And so I want to play this for you guys as well. So this is a, I believe this came today or yesterday. So let's let's play this. Arises. Who is to benefit? This crime can only be a link in a chain of attempts by those who are in, at war with our country since 2014. So what happened in 2014? The coup in Ukraine. Again, under Newland, under the Obama regime. So clearly he's making insinuation that something happened in 2014 in which there has been a sort of um, underground war, if you will, as many people haven't been acknowledging of this until the invasion in Ukraine. But anybody who's familiar with the situation knows that NATO has been moving their border and really 
trying to incite Russia into a conflict of which many people believe that this terrorist attack is an, a deliberate attempt to get them to react incredibly violently towards Ukraine or potentially whoever is behind it to then issue a legitimate war against Russia. The Nazis, the, the Kiev regime, who never stopped at any means using any kinds of inhuman tactics to achieve their goals, especially now when their so-called counteroffensive has failed, as recognized by everyone, and the, the Russian armed forces possess the initiative along the entire a front line and a, no attempts to stabilize the situation for the Ukrainian sides have been successful. This has led to their attempts to penetrate our borders and their shellings of Russian civilian infrastructure, including energy infrastructure, their attempts to make strikes at the Crimean Bridge, the Crimean Peninsula. These steps make up a logical sequence of terrorist attacks and attempts to intimidate the Russian society and sow discord, and at the same time to show their own population that the Kiev regime is still strong, that the only thing people need is to obey the orders, the orders that come from Washington to fight to the last Ukrainian and to uh, adopt the new orders on mobilization, uh, cr create uh, youth brigades like Hitler used to have, and the money that are being provided for these purposes will certainly be appropriated by the higher-ups, like has happened in Ukraine. And Right. Okay, so again, for who's behind it, in my personal opinion, and we're getting ready to bring on Jose and Ivan to discuss their uh, perspectives on this, which I'm sure will be very insightful. I believe it's the Western intelligence agencies. I believe it's MI6, it's Mossad, it's the CIA. And people think, well, why would the Western intelligence agencies have anything to do with radical Islam? Well, in case you've been living under a rock for the last two decades, um, we know for a fact, like the IDF actually arms the same people that they say they're against, along with the CIA. We know that the CIA had a, a significant hand in building uh, the jihadists. Here's uh, Brzezinski literally talking about, we're not going to go through that because again, the point is the open panel, but I'll share this link with you guys. If you want to read about the CIA, Julian Assange's leak in 2016, there's the link there. If you want this little general, again, it's the BBC, so take it for what it's worth, but it was just a general overview to get a mainstream narrative opinion on what's happening. And then here's an article literally by the Times of Israel talking about how the IDF armed the rebels in Syria. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight, if you weren't familiar with Timber Sycamore, was a classified weapons supply by the CIA to radical Islamic organizations under Barack Obama. So. Is this crazy? No, we actually know about it. Now, I don't, I'm not telling you to trust Wikipedia, of course, but interestingly enough that it was requested by Prime Minister Netanyahu and the King of Jordan that the U.S. and the CIA supply weapons to these radical Islamic rebel groups. Very interesting. And here's uh, ISIS may have obtained anti-tank missiles from the CIA. Uh, no surprise there either. Now, I want to bring on our guest before we... Um, before I got, get into anything else, I did have a video right here, and this was, we'll just play the a quick few minutes. This is Vladimir uh, Sloviev, and he is a major broadcaster in Russia, and I just want to play this so you get a sense of what is the Russian narrative and the Russian perspective on this topic, and then uh, I want to bring Jose and Ivan and get into an open panel discussion. So here is um, Vladimir talking about his opinion, the, the sort of Russian populist opinion of what just occurred thank you for joining us i know it's very late in russia you've got the floor sir thank you alex and thank you to all americans that uh, send the uh, very warm words to russians who do suffer from one of the worst terrorist attacks in the history of uh, our country we can compare with 9 11. during 9 11 there were almost 5,000 people that were killed. This uh, terrorist attack was aiming 
to kill 6,200 people that attended the concert. So far, more than 140 people died, but unfortunately, the amount of uh, deaths will only increase. A lot of people injured. So what happened? I can show you actually on the screen. Uh, we made a little presentation of how it's all happened. Uh, if my guys will get my computer on. Guys, can you show the picture? Yes, please. So that's what happened. A group of four people that were recruited through Telegram for not a huge amount of money, one million ruble each. They entered facility. It took them about 10 minutes to get straight into the concert hall. On the way, they killed a lot of people. Then they throw a cocktail molotov grenades. They started fire and immediately left the building. Then they got on the car that were waiting for them and tried to move toward borderline with Ukraine, where they were waited by Ukrainian special forces that were planning to help them to get out through Russian-Ukrainian border. But they were stopped by Russian police and special services and through a couple of hours of uh, search hide and seek operation, we managed to get them all. They're all alive. They're talking. They have no idea that they were ISIS, as they were told by uh, United States and British and other officials. No, they were not ISIS fighters. They didn't want to die for whatever they believe in, like Islam. They want This man right here, so the reason you're seeing all that blood is um, one of them, they actually cut his ear off. It, uh, it's, I see his ear there, so that may or may not have been this gentleman right here. But you can literally watch videos when they captured these four guys, um, of which this is what they look like. I have a photo of them. So uh, you can see this was when their their appearance in court yesterday, uh, the four right here. You can see they all have black eyes. Uh, they all got beat up. Uh, they got interrogated, and Russia believes they know a lot more about what occurred uh, especially more so than any Western media is telling us. That's why I wanted to play this little video real quick, um, and I'll finish it. But if you want to look into, I'm not going to show any of the actual footage. You can go on X and you can find all that stuff. It's very easy to find. We wanted to live and to spend money. Not a lot of money. Million uh, rubles, it's like 10,000 bucks. So for 10,000 bucks, they killed an enormous amount of people. They were recruited through Telegram. That's a well-known way of recruiting. That has been done already by Ukrainian special forces. And the way a couple of terrorist attacks inside Russia done this way. Money, Telegram, they're finding special guys, give them exact instructions. It's obvious that those guys were not able to come up with this uh, rather sophisticated plan because the building itself is not an easy one. So you have to know where to go and what to do. They knew exactly, exactly what the game plan is. And they played by this game. But our special forces were one step faster and better. Then we saw this operation of uh, cover up cover up operation states in that no 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 that is not ukrainian definitely it's not ukrainian it's a lie because right now on the other side of the russian ukrainian border we saw an enormous activity of uh, ukrainian special forces that worked hand in hand with islamic terrorist organizations so we know that they're fighting hand in hand who's behind them we know for sure, thanks to New York Times article, that they were trained by CIA and other special agencies of the United States. That's why when Victoria Nuland a couple of months ago stated that uh, President Putin will get a lot of nasty surprises on the borderline. So now we see what's in her definition borderline is and what kind of nasty surprises she planned for our country. There's only one leader of Western world who didn't express his feelings toward Russians and didn't send you know, the right words, who didn't mourn with us, who didn't support Russian people after this awful attack. This is Zelensky. This little 
drug addict personality managed to blame Russian President Putin for this attack. The only person in the world that did that. Even President Biden, although he hated and he hates Putin, didn't come up with this. But Zelensky could not find even one word toward Russian citizens. And actually, as we talk right now, there's a huge attack on Russian city, Belgorod. And every time they hit Belgorod, and it has nothing to do with military infrastructure. I've been there yesterday. They hit hospitals, and they hit huge apartment houses. And they hit them with NATO weaponry, artillery provided by Czech Republic. And as of now, they attack Crimea and Sevastopol. That's why actually I'm really surprised, Alice. Why do all those NATO guys uh, trying to show the empathy to Russian people when they love when someone is killing us? They supply Ukrainian Nazis with all weapons in the world. Even French little guy is willing to send his troops to fight Russians. So why are they right now trying to show that they're humans and they have the human-like feelings, saying, oh, we're so sorry. Oh, poor Russian people were with you. A few months ago, they applauded to terrorist attacks in St. Pete when one of prominent Russian journalists was killed. And a lot of people who attended this meeting with him were wounded. Every time when there's a terrorist attack done by the Ukrainians, West applauded, stating that Ukraine can do whatever they want to fight ugly Russia. But as of now, we see that behind this attack, not just Ukrainian special forces, but the real masters, CIA and British special op. That's right. And we saw Obama... And so we'll, we'll stop it there. Um, but to conclude, who I believe is behind it, again, following this general remark, I believe it is Western intelligence. I believe this is a way to try to uh, evoke the Russian bear into a larger conflict so that they can legitimate a further war and escalation of things against Russia. So the CIA, MI, MI6, Mossad, thinking, you know, them coming out and stating it's behind ISIS or ISIS is, is taking credit for it within the, the people once they're captured, have no affiliation with ISIS. I think we can put the dots together. So that's my general take. Now, with that being said, let's bring on our brothers on the screen. I think Jose just stepped away for a second. So Ivan, when, Jose, what's up, my brothers? Um, it's been a minute, but uh, what are your guys' thoughts on this topic? I'll let Jose go first because he probably knows much more of them. <laughs> yeah, so there, uh, as far as in terms of which group specifically uh, carried it out, there's uh, two sets of rumors that I've heard, at least at least in my circles. One is, this is why uh, Victoria Newland uh, was essentially resigned or was forced to resign. Um, so that's the rumor that suggests that uh, it's more so coming from the American side of the equation. The other, which comes from... Oh, hold, on, hold on, let me clarify there. So she was forced to resign. Why? So she can do, she can sort of work, uh, you know, more black ops, and that way she's not tied with the State Department while she does this stuff, or what? So according to that rumor, uh, the D.C. or the Beltway uh, does, did not want to escalate things that far uh, with Russia, and she had already set stuff in motion, and so that's why she was pushed to resign. I see, I see. So that's, that's the suggest. That's the rumor on one side. Uh, the rumor from sources on the other side of the uh, world uh, over in the old world suggest that uh, uh, what do you call it that uh, mi6 is um, more so uh, more so to blame but um, yeah so that, that's those are the two rumors that I've heard concerning this and we'll find out soon enough but either way uh, no one is pointing no one's pointing to the uh, false flag hypothesis uh, and no one is pointing to no ISIS. serious person. At least I see people, the, the typical normie Western normies on X trying to lay that out. Yeah. So the only question is, is this something that uh, the West intended to do to escalate or is this a case of some them, them this, you know, what do you call it? Ground level or stuff being set in motion by a certain undersecretary that went beyond what, um, you know, what the Beltway was actually wanting. So that, that's the only thing that's up for debate, really. And where's your opinion lie? 
Because um, you, well, you mentioned British, because we know for a fact that British British Special Forces is the personal security of Zelensky right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Um, I think Britain wants to escalate uh, to World War Three, at least the leadership there, and uh, the U.S. is amazingly, at least some portion of the U.S. government is trying to apply the brakes. That's my impression. Okay. Yeah, that that's so interesting. I think that. I kind of agree with everything that was said. I don't know which part of the West is like spearheading this, if it's the British or if it's the Americans. My guess would be that it, it would be like um, a part of the deep state in the US, but um, I'm not sure because I don't know the, the specifics of the situation and what, what the power players are wanting to do over there. But uh, this is obviously not a, not a false flag. And this is probably not a an ISIS, um, you know, kind of deal because um, these people weren't trained. Uh, they, they didn't seem to be like uh, trained. They were expendable. And um, I think that part of the narrative has to be questioned as well, because uh, like the, the money they said that they were paid was so little and yet they executed the plan. I wouldn't say perfectly, but to a great degree of, of um, let's say proficiency because like these people didn't have weapons training. How did they get like to to do such havoc without the weapons training? And why were they uh, what why were they expected by Ukrainian forces? Like if that's solid uh, information, then we know that there are too many players here. And like I want to apply Occam's razor. And I'd say that the Ukrainians don't have the, the, the resources or the intel to, to do it by themselves. But I don't know if, if I don't know how many are involved in this. So. Right. Well, I saw today that a, a father and son were arrested in affiliation with it in Russia. Um, so it so, sounds like they're uncovering more. But I think in regards to this situation one of the more interesting questions to speculate upon is the geopolitical situation that's going to follow and one of the things that i suspect i'm curious of your guys's opinions as i think that outside the western world this is actually going to gain more sympathy for russia and actually create more allies for russia um we've already seen with BRICS, as we've talked about in previous open panels and what's and what's happening and unfolding with ukraine that Russia is getting stronger. They're forming more allyships with various nation states. And I suspect that this is actually only going to strengthen those bonds with the countries that show support for them. As Putin said in the first video that I showed, while um, if it does come to light that the West was behind it, I think they're going to lose more support from the international community, which I mean, it, they really have. It's uh, outside of brute force through money or military threat. I mean, it's really Israel, the United States, and NATO uh, that is, it feels like, and I'm curious to your, your guys' opinion, is against the, the rest of the world at this point. The thing is, what they're doing is objective suicide. Because the, the fact is, they want to pivot to fight China. And that's the whole point of, you know, deploying troops to Taiwan recently, which is a gross violation of everything the United States has agreed to, you know, over the past 50 years, since things warmed up with China. Um, so that, um, and the scary thing about that is that, uh, at least, at least the last time I checked the Chinese, uh, you know, foreign ministry and, uh, the, their, um, uh, what's it called? I think it's called global times that their English, the, the government's English, uh, you know, newspaper or, you know, state news, uh, neither have, they've actually been silent on the issue of, uh, American troops being deployed in Taiwan, uh, which is the most dangerous, uh, response that could come from china because that means they are going to do something um so the the worst if one's trying to pivot to fight china after losing to russia in a proxy war you know on on russia's border as well as losing a proxy war um in uh, syria and um potentially you know while also losing a proxy war in africa and potentially losing a proxy war in in the middle east again if israel decides to kick off things with Le with lebanon uh, or with hezbollah in particular um, yeah, it, it's, it's just absolutely in, insan. It's just sheer insanity from a diplomatic, uh, standpoint. And uh, it's going to be that much harder 
I mean, one, the, the U.S. has no hope. No, no, there is no road to victory in fighting China, just like there is no road to victory in fighting Russia. Right. Uh, the U.S. lacks. It has no industrial base. Uh, it doesn't even have the skills to rebuild this industrial base. Like just right. to build. So to get to where Russia was in 2014, it was in 2014 when Russia really started kicking up overdrive in their industrial expansion for military purposes. Um, just to get to where Russia was in 2014, just just to get the skills needed to have a, have a skilled population to actually build the industry and that can be run in the United States is going to take 30 years. So it's just it's it's what do you call it? It we're what my my personal opinion is the the U.S. government is effectively on autopilot. You have a lot of things that were set in motion, um, you know, years, dec you know, more than a decade, some some things more than two decades ago. And there's no one actually steering the ship at this point. Right. And that's part of why uh, the deep state, as people refer to, which is essentially faceless bureaucrats there. That's why they want to keep Joe Biden, because Joe Biden is the perfect president who has no power and no capacity to stop or do or influence anything. Right. So it just lets the bureaucrats go nuts and they all run crazy with their pet programs and their pet projects, all of which were set in motion a long time ago. And that's what's leading to this crazy disaster. Yep. So, so basically, Jose, let me let me get the, the idea across that. Basically, you think that the deep state is trying to, let's say, implement these plans because um, some corrupt oligarchs are gaining money from the transactions, but it actually doesn't help a, in any way uh, to further American goals. Uh, it's it's more like okay, so it's more like the intelligent people are dead or gone or dead or retired, uh, or they've been uh, canceled, and the people who are currently running things they have no idea why they're doing what they're doing. Like that that's essentially what what is happening. Like the Titanic is going straight for the iceberg, and except that the guy who the people who control the wheel and the steering and the engines, none of them have any clue, and none of them even know how the machinery that they're operating operates. Right, mm -hmm. and, and I want to back that up because. I have a friend, I know people are going to, very red-pilled, orthodox guy, so we'll just put it that, but he is a, um engineer for NASA, and he is now in the administrative department. He was talking about how incompetent these federal agencies are, to Jose's point. He said they, do, they, couldn't, they can't, like, even, like, they can't do these things. They literally do not have the skill set anymore that it, these are become bureaucratic organizations that get federal funding and they just do monotonous things to stay afloat. And he highlighted the same thing. He said the biggest problem in the United States is the actual manpower with skill sets to build the sort of industrial foundation that the nation would need. We don't have those people. And the government is deliberately, you know, failing upward the people that have no legitimate skill set. And he says it's terrifying. And the American people have no idea because they assume these people go to universities and get these degrees and work for these major institutions or federal agencies. And he said, they're totally incompetent. They're totally incompetent. And part of that, part of that I think was planned in regards to the U S uh, um, devolving into this incompetent spiral, uh, because the fact is, um, all right. So keeping it TOS friendly, the, the ruling class of the United States did intend to pivot to China. Like they straight up plan to move to China. There's a reason why you had all these empty cities b being built in China. And no, it was not just real estate speculation. Uh, and then their guy, Zhang Zemin, got knocked out. Xi, Xi Jinping managed to secure power within China and he told them no. So a lot of things are in motion and their lifeboat that they were planning to hop on, hop, well, hop onto uh, essentially just told them no. Um, and that's why, like, for example, like the deindustrialization of the United States, that was intentional. There's a reason why that industry was sent to China, because um, it's the it's the for lack of a better term, that's the pop, that's the that's the heart of the world population. If one if one intends to rule the world, uh, that is the that is the center uh, population wise. And even in terms of like skilled workforce, et cetera, like I know, like people see, you know, China making a lot of or a lot of junk that we have here, to, you know, to, on, on the state side is made in China. But the fact is the Chinese do make good stuff. They just keep it for themselves. Like even like, you know, for example, high speed trains, like specifically maglevs, China's number one on, on that. Right. So it's, um, you know, it, it's what do you call it? So th that was, you know, speaking about the, you know, the ruling class plan that they again, that's why guys like Mark Zuckerberg, for example, there's a reason why. Yeah, he married someone who was Chinese and he was had this whole thing about learning Mandarin. Um, I can say for me growing up in New York, uh, so my dad was a tutor for and a math teacher and a tutor for a lot of really, really wealthy people uh, in, in, in Manhattan and in New York. 
and uh, everybody, everybody was uh, having their kids learn Mandarin because there was indeed a plan. Like there was indeed a plan to pivot to China, essentially the same way that the empire was moved from London to Washington, D.C. They wanted to move it from Washington, D.C. to Beijing. And then things didn't work out as planned. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can I can see that and totally agree with it. Ivan, you got thoughts on that, brother? That's very interesting. Like I have heard that before and I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, I don't know um, how much, like, th these events, like the like the terrorist attack is, in a way, very far removed from all this, but it's definitely related in some sense. And it's very hard for people from, like, looking at it from the ground level to, to reconstruct, like, what is happening. Perhaps, like, people hundreds of years in the future, if there is such a future, will not be able to do it anyway with better information about it. So... Uh, at least right now what we have is uh like a, a feeling that at least from the from 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 us who, who we are we are westerners we have the this sensation that at least the west is is kind of losing the plot and uh i see it all the time in the in the sense of the the ethics that's that's been like dominant at least in the in the western sphere i i'm very privy to a lot of conversations and like all uh, like in all of the spectrum of, of, of politics here in Spain. And uh, funny, funnily enough, like um, the, the extreme right wing and the extreme left wing, they're both agreeing in the fact that they don't want to join uh, this NATO um, push into, into Russia. And uh, they're finding a lot of common ground. And that is starting to become like the main position that is eating away at the at the Nambi Pambi Center, because uh, right now, like um, the people who are speaking about democracy and human rights and all of that, are the center right and the center left, and we're all starting to see it like like a sham. So, um, and from from our perspective, I think as Orthodox, we would say that it is a sham, and and it and it has to be, um, let's say, a, those things have to be contested, but. But in a way, it's kind of sad because we're seeing like the the the, the empire fall in real time, and yeah. uh, in our hearts, I think we would want to like warn them before everything goes down. But it seems as though um, we're too late even at, at doing that. I don't know what you guys think and how it's related to the to the topic, but but I think that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, in re in relation to it, uh, and I'm curious what Jose's thoughts. Did you see? Uh, Taiwan kind of freak out that it was like three or four military jets of China flew over the island and entered their airspace and was, and I guess, uh, from my understanding, the U.S. moved the carrier ship closer to Taiwan. Um, so as we speculated back when the invasion occurred in 2022, that, you know, if, if Russia and China become incredibly close allies, which their economies have already linked up, I think that it was like it went from. 10 or 15 to 30 percent now of the russian economy is exports to to china so they are they are increasingly becoming tied at the hip and if that's the case you know whether it's nato trying to build a front line in ukraine or in finland i've, I've seen that russia's moved troops up north or just china decides to take over taiwan both of these uh are opportunities for the west to try to you know, in, uh, instigate this World War Three, but I don't know. What are your thoughts about the Taiwan thing? I don't know if you saw that over the weekend. I didn't see the. I didn't see that. Um, but um, what I was going to say is, uh, the thing is, China was planning to reintegrate Taiwan uh, by in the 2040s, and the plan was for a peaceful un reunification, kind of like what happened with Hong Kong. So, um, just a little bit of background in terms of Xi Jinping. So he was governor, I forget the name of the two provinces, but the two provinces across the sea from Taiwan, he was governor for one, one at least one of them. And the thing is the governors from those provinces, their job was, uh, for the past like several decades has been to attract investment from Taiwan in order to promote, uh, Chinese Taiwanese connection and essentially, you know, keep, keep that the island, um, connect integrated economically with the main or to integrate the island as much as possible with the mainland uh economically so xi jinping is literally on a first first name basis with the entire ruling elite of taiwan they all know like they all know him face to face uh, from back when he was a governor um the other thing too is i'll point out is uh the camp kumintang the kmt which is you know the group that fought mao uh they're now pro-unification so it's 
Oh, it's really? not a matter like, yeah. Um, and it's not a surprise. I mean, if, if not to go through a whole Chinese history thing, but like anyone who's like deeply, you know, deeply knowledgeable to KMT, the fact is Xi Jinping actually is like their ideal ruler. Um, and also it, it also helps the fact that Xi Jinping, you know, Mao Zedong wanted him dead as did Mao's wife want him dead. And, you know, they killed his dad and his mother and his, uh, many of his siblings, but you know, that right. it's, a uh, it's a different, different story slash history. I'm just looking forward to the day when, um, when, when, uh, Xi Jinping is actually able to dismantle the Mao cult. Um, so hopefully that'll happen at some point. Yeah. What Daniel Levy wrote there. So that's, uh, that's a huge violation of uh, all the agreements that China and the U S have had. Uh, I'd say the equivalent of China's China doing equivalent action would be China deploying, um, troops to the Mexican border in order to conduct uh, military exercises. So that's, um, yeah, it's, it's a probably, you know, one it's, it shows the U S it's can't keep any agreement, cannot, can't keep any treaty or any agreement or any statement. Uh, unfortunately the U S now has a solid reputation earned around the world uh, as of always lying. Right. So if you can't trust the Americans to hold to anything they say or trust DC in particular, yeah, DC, you know, there is yep. a distinction between state and people. And, you know, I'm someone who would argue that Dixie's not even American. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a different story. Um, but some of, some of the stuff coming out of Russia after the terrorist attack, like uh, Vladimir, we saw, uh, is knowledgeable of the MAGA support and like not that again we we have our own criticism of Donald Trump but my point is there is a recognition within Russia of like the general American people and then like Washington DC and that there's this massive disconnect between them I don't know how the average Russian views that and they wouldn't be I, I wouldn't fault them for making uh general general takes and stereotypes based on Americans in in particular but there is some recognition by those that are familiar that, you know, the American people do not support almost anything that's going on in, in the name of a, of our country beginning, you know, well, you could point to a lot of things, but ex especially since Bush and the invasion of Iraq. Yeah, I'd say as well as a rule, Russians are in general, because of how their culture functions, they, 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 they have a full deep like cultural understanding of the distinction between state and people in a way that Americans don't. And so that's where you get, uh, you get two, two, two things that I see a lot in, in real life. You have one path of, um, you know, I'll say your average cosmopolitan, uh, take it Austin or New York. And, uh, you know, they see the Russian people as inherently evil, uh, like the state, or, you know, you can look at uh, your alternative right circles where you'll see, uh, them saying, you'll see people who will assume that, um, you know, because the, the Russian state leadership is based ergo all the Russian people are based. So it's you can look on the right or the left or you know, any any flavor of American politics, and you see this uh, routine habit of being unable to distinguish between the the leadership, uh, state leadership, and the people as a whole. Uh, you see the same thing in terms of religion. So, like for example, like the, the concept of um, you know breaking down Islam to you know the radical moderate divide, uh, frankly, doesn't actually apply to real Islam as practiced. Uh, Islam is more divided than Protestantism. Uh, that's uh, you know, and there's, I mean, true, like even within Sunnism, you have like eight different creeds. So this is not, this is not, um, you know, it, it's just, there's a lot of oversimplifications that, uh, you know, we tend to default to in the West, America in particular. And again, part of that is because of just how intentionally, how absolutely poor America's education is. Like one thing I, I learned um, th this year was, uh, what's his name? So Dewey, Dewey actually went to the Soviet Union to uh, propose his methods uh, for uh, education. And Joseph Stalin concluded that Dewey's methods were child abuse and banned it and kicked him out. <laughs> so Dewey went back to America and guess who adopted Dewey's stuff? America did. Of course. So I just, I just find it to be kind of amazing. So like, you know, Stalin, you know, very evil man, but he, he considered Dewey's system to be too evil. So I'll just let that sink in for a second. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I may interject um, on this geopolitical stuff, I think that the, the issue, I don't know if it has to do with something to do with a uh, Russian culture in itself, the, this like um, attempt at being honorable. But the what I can see, at least from an academics perspective, is that the like the the Russian people have a more a, a, of a historic a view and they they think about um geopolitics in terms of history while the us has more of a pragmatic and more of a let's say more real politic kind of way of viewing at things so it's not that the i wouldn't i wouldn't say that 
while I do agree that there's a there's a distinction between the elites and the and the people, and that the American people are much more honorable than the elites, I wouldn't be too hard on the elites, although they are very corrupt in in, in a moral sense, because I think like the the academic circles in which they've formed their views, um, they do not see diplomacy as anything other. As a, than a way to exert soft power on enemies. So they're, they're, they don't have any ideas of being honest or integrity. Like they're not playing the game a, a, on a long term because they're thinking about they're like not. edging out like small advantages to keep on being like the military hegemon. So in that sense, it's like if you take the ideas from uh, Machiavelli, like that is more closer to what the what i would say like the the intellectual elite uh, in in north america are are leaning uh, into in terms of strategy like the way i see and what i hear from them is that uh, as long as they're powerful they uh, they can lie because their lies are instrumental to the larger goal so it's so they don't care about uh, their standing in in let's say, um, in the minds of other countries, as long as they can keep being the, the imperial power. And they, they think that uh, people will somehow, um, I don't know, um, lose sight of that history because America itself does not think on, on historical terms. Like that, that would be my argument. Like, for example, although like the Plan Condor, which was um, what the U.S. tried to do to, to keep Latin America uh, under under its boot and all those sorts of things seem like the the um, like the the way of operating of some of someone who doesn't really care uh, about opening genuine channels of diplomacy like and if you're in a stronger position why would you from a real politic kind of perspective like uh, yeah i can i can agree with the part that they aren't long-term focused. Now I do, as an American, I do hold them responsible and I do find them guilty for, but you're right. They are groomed in such a way and be at the Ivy league schools, be at universities, but these are dishonorable people and it's not a meritocracy. It's a, it's a sort of evilocracy. It's like the more you're willing to be complicit and go along with this agenda and lie and blackmail and do anything for you know the outright acquisition of power and the maintaining of that like that's not what i want you know i as most americans are much more nationalist than our our government even closely uh resembles and this military industrial complex which is basically that's what a mil that's what america is it's like they are depleting it and just utilizing it as a sort of military arm of this globalist network and i do personally find hold them and find them responsible for for everything that they're doing but they are groomed in a way to sort of operate on on these on these standards and uh yeah yeah that that was what i i was trying to go um for like you cannot fault like pragmatism for losing track of what's important like because they're always trying to let's say focus on a short-term goal that that for example their immediate superiors um, tell them to do like for example uh, i think newland is is a is a psychopath but absolutely even as a psychopath she's working for a very specific goal that doesn't ultimately uh, like gel with uh, the interests of the of the of the country so i think that that kind of pragmatism it's it's not only that they're incompetent even when they're competent they're competent and doing things that don't help others or the country itself so it's like you're shooting off to different like directions and in that sense, I'd say um, it's kind of a very silly strategy because it's it's more of a reflection of the lack of identity of a country that's trying to win at any cost without lose without seeing that that way you lose your own identity. Like right. at least the people have have that kind of idea, but the elites don't anymore. And yeah, they, they have no allegiance to the country anymore. I, I would argue, it, kind of to your point that. I, I think many Americans still have an ethos of Americana and some sense of self-identity, but I don't think the elites 
share that at all. And that's why they operate in such a way which they do not reflect the will of the people. And you're talking about long term trajectory and in, in plat- uh, uh, strategy planning. And I would say that's one of the problems with the general four year election cycle in America. But obviously, if the deep state exists, there is an entrenched power mechanism that is able to sort of substantiate plans in the long term. The problem is um, it's absolutely in opposition to what everybody wants. And unlike China or Russia, you know, I know that Putin has elections and people question the validity of the 87 percent. However, certainly the majority of Russians support Putin and he is representative of the people's interest to some degree much more so than the West. I mean, name a Western nation in which you could say, yeah, they're they're certainly operating on the best will of the people. I mean, Canada, Britain, Germany, Italy, France, like who? None of them. So there's just this massive conglomerate of like globalist deep state affiliation, but their but their plans are self-sabotaging back to Jose's point. I mean, it is suicide. It is suicide. Nothing they're doing is bringing people to the Western side or having more allies or more compassion and or understanding of what our what our strategic plans are. We don't have any. We don't have any. It's just about it's a, you know, attaining their particular goals, which is a globalist uh, power structure. Yeah, um, I, I want to throw this in. Maybe it doesn't really fit. But for example, what's happening in Haiti right now? That there's a big um, issue with a with a government that has been take run over by by drug lords. Like that would be a very uh, let's say interesting opportunity for a country to invade them and and even like set set up their own like government uh, in a way that could be both virtuous and also economically um, let's say uh, feasible for 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 imperialistic interests. So. Like, for example, you could, you, if, if you wanted to criticize Putin, for example, um, what he's doing in the Ukraine, you could say, like, he's taking this humanitarian crisis as, a, as an opportunity to um, invade Ukraine and, and um, let's say, carve a part of that country and, and annex it. And I think that, that idea, which so deeply offends, um, so deeply offends Western liberals, it's kind of a more virtuous um, strategy and a more honest way to approach life, like saying, look, there are horrible atrocities happening over here. I have the military power to guarantee that these things don't happen anymore. I'm going to use my military power and I'm going to assert my, my, my control over this. And, and that's kind of a more, let's say, more honest way to deal about uh, with, with dominion and, 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 let's say, political power. Than, than this economic warfare that we're trying to do in the West. But, and, and this is what it confuses me, at least, and maybe you know better than me. But uh, like, for example, from that old world perspective, where you see, let's say, a, a, a chink in the armor of your neighbor, and you say, well, perhaps this is an opportunity for me to step up and displace their incompetent rulers. Um, why, why doesn't America use those legitimate opportunities to to, let's say, uh, gain territory? And why does it always like focus on unwinnable wars abroad that only benefit the elite? Because it's an extractive empire. Like that's the concept of uh, what is the distinction between an extractive imperial versus a, a generative imperial? So it, it's that's the difference between Tsarist Russia and uh, the Republic of the United States. Mm. Um, that's your, or, you know, the Spanish empire versus the British empire. Uh, you know, the fact is, uh, so in terms of Haiti, like uh, to, to speak a little bit about Haiti, the fact is Haiti would be better off. It would, everything would have been way better off if the U.S. never intervened in the first place. In Haiti. Absolutely. Um, and honestly, the worst possible thing for Haiti would be the U.S. to intercede, intervene, uh, because historically, again, because America is ruled by extremely evil people. The fact is, you know, a lot of them got a lot of money off of uh, the intervention interventions in Haiti, made a lot of money off of that, including, of course, you know, the Clintons. So that's not something well, it, it's. There's an element of the United States historically has not respected its neighbors the same way that that, frankly, Russia has. I mean, even with you know stuff that's been tenuous, like with Poland, um, you know, the fact is, if you, if you compare the U.S. and its treatment of its neighbors, you know, versus Russia or versus China, uh, like Russia and China have a much, much better track record. Even Japan has a better track record. 
and you know that's including you know the sino-japanese war and uh it, their invasion of korea so it's um yeah it, it's it, it, that's the thing because you also you mentioned about you know in terms of like gaining territory the thing is like the u.s does control the western hemisphere like I mean, yeah. just take point point example but how the u.s likes to do it the U.S. likes to extract and it likes to have some plausible deniability and the idea that, you know, it's, sp it's spreading freedom and democracy. So, um, for example, so like just using Colombia as an example, because I know it the best. Um, the fact is, like, if you if someone wants to run for the mayor of Bogota, they have to get approved by the State Department. So there is no one on the ballot, even for your local elections uh, in, in, in Colombia, who you can vote for, who is not approved by the U.S. government. So that's how the U.S. controls things. They used to actually micromanage a lot more. Um, they 1948 to 19, after they assassinated Gaetan, and I think it was 48, um, that kicked off a lot of violencia, and there was you know like a quarter million people who died from that, and then that led to the civil war, kicking off essentially seven years of m intentional micromanaging by Washington D.C. And this is back when uh, D.C. was being run by highly competent people, um, <laughs> you know, and ironically mostly white men. Uh, they, their micromanagement, trying to micromanage Colombia to the, the, the lowest common, you know, the lowest detail, lowest level of government resulted in state failure in seven years. Mm -hmm. So it's, so the, the U S was trying to do that, you know, like sign for lack of a better term, like, you know, very hands-on scientific micromanagement. Now what they do is, you know, they, they want to, they want a local elite to run things. So things are stable, but they want that local elite to be wholly dependent on the United States for its power. So they do not have a local power base. That's why the U.S., for example, turned on on Pinochet. Uh, so, like, did the U.S. help Pinochet get into power? Yes. Why is it that Pinochet uh, was not kicked out of power? Because uh, the United States ceased to support him. Why did they cease to support him and want to get rid of him? Because Pinochet did do some good for Chile, and that was seen as a threat. Because if you support, if you support, like, for example, like Bautista in, in Cuba would be another example. If you support, um, you know, or Somoza in Nicaragua, like, if you, if you, uh, if a, if a puppet of the United States is actively doing something good for the local population that risks them building up local popularity and then the ability to act independently of the United States. So that's how, like, for example, Saddam Hussein, he was a puppet of the United States. He started doing stuff that was actually good for Iraq, uh, which builds his popularity there, popularity in Iraq, which meant the U S had to remove him. Um, and yeah, so, and, and frankly, there's granted the U S U S control of Russia was not the same way in, in the nineties. Um, but the fact is, you know, like, you know, people talk about, you know, are, are um, you know, Russian elections legitimate? Well, at this point, it doesn't really matter um, because, you know, the, the amount of support that Putin has. But right. You know, like, exactly. Of, yeah. But in terms of like, how was he installed? So the thing is, Putin was not someone who's looking for power. I forget the name of the general who actually picked him and forced him into office. But he was essentially a compromised candidate between the oligarchs who were backed by the United States and the military because the military was threatened, threatening to do a, a military coup. Um, if, uh, the, the abject plundering of Russia didn't stop, um, at, at the level that it was doing. Um, and the fact is like you do the uh, excess death calculations, essentially U S economic war on Russia after, after they, they voluntarily stood down it, uh, after the cold war, um, uh, effectively led to nearly 7 million Russian excess deaths, mm. uh, that, that can be labeled as economic ex excess deaths from economic, uh, ec economic plundering. So and the irony is the reason why Putin in particular, why he ended up getting selected. Well, so one, he was a compromise between the oligarchs and the, uh, and, and the, uh, and, and the military. So the military were okay with him. The oligarchs were okay with him because he would let them, the oligarchs would let, they would let him, you know, let them operate, uh, at least initially he, he would. And, uh, he was, uh, respected by the, the, the military sufficiently. Um, and then the other aspect of it, the reason why he uh, was pushed for by, by the military was because of what happened in uh, Serbia, Yugoslavia and Kosovo. The fact is, if it wasn't for the U.S. genocide and ethnic cleansing of the Serbs in, in Kosovo and, you know, the bombing of, you know, you know, and, you know, what do you call it? Sowing the fields of Serbia with uh, depleted uranium. If that hadn't happened, Putin would not have come to power. So mm. I, this, this is a great irony because I know like uh, there's this thing you'll see in, in Serbian Russian history where the Serbs are very grateful to the Russians for essentially the Russians destroyed their empire uh, <laughs> trying to save Serbia from uh, from from the central powers, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And I'd say in a sense, uh, Serbia returned the favor in the 90s. Serbia got its, you know, got brutal, brutalized by the West. Right. Uh, and as a result, uh, Russia got Putin power, which means that the West is actually going to get kicked out of Eastern Europe. So, you know, and a lot of Serbs who died, you know, in, in, in you know, Kosovo, Serbia, et cetera. Just one thing I would like to point out is 
effectively y'all y'all did actually with that repay the debt that you had to uh to russia and the end result is now you're going to have a strong an insanely strong uh we'll call it you know east versus a absolutely dilapidated west uh that is not even not even a paper tiger i mean it's just paper at this point it's just paper yeah and, and i highlighted earlier while you were speaking uh jose that that 1.2 trillion dollar spending bill which uh goes to ukraine um israel not a single dollar goes towards our southern border which again highlights the ineptitude and the intentional destruction as we've already articulated this sort of uh, uh suicide attempt by the west that you know yeah it, it it's controlled demolition exactly uh natashki yeah it's controlled demolition absolutely is and you're yeah you laid a, laid out a great point in regard to the history between russia and serbia because just recently i don't know if you saw but the soccer teams had like a um a, a recent game um uh, what is it called when it's it's uh, when it's uh you you play a game and it doesn't mean anything it's friendly. a huh it's a friendly yeah so and the whole entire stadium, this was in Moscow, Russia, and the entire stadium was singing together like various Slavic uh, songs. And and they they both stood for both the national anthems of both Serbia and Russia together. And so we're absolutely seeing a realignment of Eastern Europe in regards to its Slavic and uh, honoring of, of Russian history and its importance right now in the world. Mm -hmm. And actually, even even you pointing that in terms of like, why is it that the United States should not, not go into Haiti? Uh, the fact is, one, you know, the Haitians will find something that works for them. But two, just as an example, like the U.S. went into Kosovo. And uh, what did the United States do in Kosovo? They handed it over to the Albanian mafia. How exactly. did that go? It's a complete and total corrupt cess cesspool. And the fact is, even though they did exile practically all the Serbs from, Kos from, from Kosovo, uh, the Kosovars are not going to be able to hold on to it once the U.S. collapses. Right. It's because they're, they're just so objectively corrupt. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with that. Um, we had a few super chats come in. So if you guys want to show some love and support for today's stream, you have any comments or questions, feel free to use the Streamlabs or the Dono Chat link or YouTube. Um, over on Dono Chat, we got three super chats that just came in. First one's from Blue Skittle. He says, comments and questions. Well, thank you so much for your comments and questions. Blue Skittle throws in a $5 super chat. God bless you, brother. And Dennis R. throws in $10. Says, secular American working to become a baptized Orthodox. I find myself becoming more pro-Russia daily. Right or wrong, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, Russia, certainly we have sympathy for as an Orthodox Christian because they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And... I think it's almost a an American duty at this point to be outright critical of our own government. Uh, not that it's doing much, but I think um, I can understand your sentiments as becoming an Orthodox Christian and your um, friendly sympathies extended towards Russia. Same here. And then Patrick, my good buddy, Patrick throws in $30. Thank you so much, brother, for the generous super chat. And he said, uh, no, no comment. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for that. Um, yeah, in regards to the Haiti thing, you know, now the collapse of Haiti, I'm curious um, if you guys see any sort of geopolitical importance with any of that stuff going on. Um, and we can bring it back. Some people ask, yeah, we already covered the actual Russian attack uh, at the beginning of the conversation. We've kind of meandered into various geopolitical conversations uh because that was the point of the stream is one to address the attack there's only so much we can say um but then how this relates to the geopolitical situation around the world because i think it only further destabilizes the west which i think everybody on the panel generally agrees that the west in some form or fashion was behind it whether it be the training or the money or uh, you mentioned sort of Victoria Newland already setting these operations in motion. And this is why the U.S. establishment maybe wasn't as uh, fond of her desires to elicit terrorist terror attacks inside Russia. But um, what are your guys' thoughts on the sort of geopolitical situation going on right now in regards to the Western Hemisphere? 
So, like, you hard to say, like, if, if you had someone steering the wheel, so let's say you had someone who <laughs> yeah, was saying, a big if, who but... wanted to preserve the American Empire, or at least some aspect of it. So one thing you see routinely in, routinely in, in the Christian Roman Empire is when it's overextended, it always retreats back into its heartland before expanding back out, you know, a century, a century later. So the, the issue is where the United States is currently, like, it, it's way overextended. Uh, it has no industrial capacity whatsoever. It has no... Um, ability to project force in, you know, okay, for example, Yemen, Yemen is not exactly a, uh, or the, the Houthis in particular, they're not, they're not a, you know, world-class military. They, they rank like 57th, uh, based on some, um, military stuff that I was looking at and, uh, they beat the U S Navy. So that's, that's, that's how bad things are in, in the United States. So what the U S if you had someone steering the wheel, the goal, would be, I, I, they would, should retreat. I mean, the first thing they would do is retreat to the, um, to the Western hemisphere and essentially keep the heartland and uh, keep the satellite states. Because the fact is, like, you know, even recently, like, AMLO was operating stuff uh, that was going against uh, U.S. interests, and the U.S. threatened him with uh, war, and he, uh, you know, on, on the side. That's why he had all those things, like the Bloomberg articles and a bunch of other articles that were saying, um, you know, um, we have, you know, the, we, the United States has to go to war to save, uh, to spread de in democracy to Mexico by kicking out AMLO. You know, now the, the next president <laughs> for Mexico is a uh, neocon. So it's Mexico. Well, did you see? I, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I was. Sure. I, I'd, be, I'd love to get you because of your familiarity with um, some of the Central American and Southern American geopolitics going on. Did you see Mexican president in a recent conversation with the U.S. reporter? I forget what what media company it was, but he was talking about that. Uh, unlike the United States, you know, we're not actually destroying the nuclear family. This is one of the reasons why, even because they're trying to equate him as having some type of connections with the cartels and the drug trafficking. And he said, mm -hmm. look, you, you guys are creating fentanyl within your own country. Uh, certainly part of the process comes from Asia. But the reason why Mexico doesn't have the degradation and the drug addiction that you guys have in America is that we still have a culture. We still have a heritage. Um, we still have celebrations and we still have the nuclear family, all of which is gone in the United States, which... Uh, can't argue with that, but I'm curious what your what your thoughts because you you just mentioned he's a neocon. I am not familiar he with is, him at all. The next one, Scheinbaum. Oh, okay. Yeah, the ne the woman who's going to be the next president of Mexico. Oh, the, the Jewish woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, so Mexico in a sense is is you know come to heel. It, it's and it's interesting too because I know the, the irony is Mexico is actually probably I think they're the, probably the most industrialized nation in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, which, cause I know like at least the CIA, again, you know, it's whose metrics are you using. So the CIA, uh, you know, fact check, you know, fact book, which, you know, take with a grain of salt, but prior to the, uh, war in Ukraine, they, they actually measured that Mexico was as industrialized as Russia. Do I believe that? No, but, uh, Mexico is more industrialized than the United States. And I'm just saying for any, uh, American, you know, any future, you know, American empire that was to remain that that would be a serious problem to have a puppet state or satellite right on your border who actually has more capacity than you uh to for production um that's a that, that's a serious problem and so that's why like if you had someone like as far as the western hemisphere is concerned the best thing for the beltway to do is to retreat but they can't and part of the reason why they the real reason why they can't is because uh their entire financial system will collapse and freeze up uh, it's the nature of usury. Uh, so the problem with usury with compound interest is interest, you know, compound interest grows faster than real economic growth. Always. Um, there's no, there, there's, because when you look at real economic growth, when you have the like, economic growth happens when essentially you get increased energy, you know, you get more energy out of, out of using less energy. Right. So um, like the ratio, like for, for, for example, like uh, um, uh, you go back to the Roman empire and you got, uh, you know, you got literally a power from a horse. You're getting three times as much energy out of that horse as you're putting into it. Once you get the horse collar in the quote unquote dark Christian dark ages, uh, you're getting five times as much uh, power out of that horse than what you're putting into it. Um, then once you get to like steam, the first early steam engines were getting 10 to one. Uh, and then, um, you know, by the time you get to turbines, you're getting 30 to one. Uh, and then you get nuclear where things just, you know, go ballistic. Of course, we're not embracing nuclear. So the the issue is, though, whenever we have one of these things, inventions that happen that greatly increase the amount of energy society can use with the same amount of inputs, uh, growth is logarithmic. So it, essentially, you get this point of the curve where it looks exponential and then it starts tapering off as, you know, you peter out in terms of how much you can gain from that level of, uh, you know, power efficiency or power gain increase. Um, and so the 
problem is, is that compound interest is just exponential and it just keeps growing and it doesn't have that uh, tailing off point. So in, in a system where your entire financial system is dependent on, on uh, debt obligations being met and those debt obligations are growing exponentially. And I'm not just talking uh, national debt. I'm talking uh, all personal debt, business debt, uh, interbank debt. Yes, I'll open that for you. So the, essentially, th this is what forced the United States to start having to expand outside of its borders, especially in the wake of uh, the Federal Reserve Act and the establishment of, of the Federal Reserve. You have to extract wealth to meet your debt, uh, existing debt obligations within your system, lest your entire system collapses. Uh, and that's why the U.S. cannot retreat. Um, so unless it's willing to do a debt jubilee. And uh, as you can see, people's reaction, the public's reaction to uh, proposed uh, debt forgiveness, you know, for student loans, uh, which are something that cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. Um, debt forgiveness is not going to happen. You know, Jesus Christ said, you know, when he taught us how to pray, you know, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So, I mean, if it's one thing to not forgive, I mean, so if you don't forgive the debts that, you know, your people, the debts that people owe you, if you don't forgive those and Christ said, you'll be forgiven the same way, which is not at all. Right. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I'm just saying, I don't want to be the guy, I don't want to stand before the throne, you know, uh, on judgment day. And having to give an account why I opposed forgiving debts that weren't even owed to me, which, you know, so it's that, that's why the U.S. is screwed in this system. It's like the only way out is, frankly, is repentance and like serious repentance uh, for the empire, like serious repentance where you can have debt forgiveness. Like the fact is, OK, so, uh, you know, Putin, he's he gets referred to as a tyrant. And in the oldest sense of the word, that is actually correct. So a tyrant in the oldest, oldest initial, like if you read Plutarch, which is like actually my Plutarch is right behind me, those red books right there. Um, but yeah, th there's quite, you notice that the tyrants in Greek history, uh, there are ind individuals who came to power and they forgave debts. Like literally that's, that's what a tyrant was. Someone right. like, a, a, a you know, essentially, you know, authoritarian who forgives debts. That, that was the original use of the word tyrant in, in, in ancient Greek. Um, and uh, you look at Putin, uh, you know, he paid off the debts uh, of the, uh, that the U S uh, he paid off, not just the debts Russia had, he paid off even the, 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 Ukrainian debt of, of, from the U.S. from the era of the USSR, uh, he even offered to pay off the debts of Greece uh, during the debt crisis that happened back in like what was that like 2012? Yeah, um, yeah. And Greece rejected it because Greece is a puppet state of Britain, which means it's a puppet state of the United States. Right. Um, which is crazy because Putin offered Greece to pay off all its debts. Uh, he offered to build them a pipeline so they would get all that oil, uh, you know, natural gas money and oil money. Um, and, uh, on top of it, Germany wanted Greece out, uh, because that would strengthen Germany's financial, uh, thing. So Germany offered several billion dollars in cash, like straight to Greece, like, Hey, please take this, just leave and, and let Putin pay off, you know, your debt obligations. And, um, Britain of course entered into the European union to screw with Germany and France, but mainly Germany and, uh, Greece being in the European union and having this crazy debt fiasco is really bad for Germany, which means it's really good for the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom controlling the Greek government said, you know, you're not going to accept that. And so they didn't, they didn't, uh, that was the, anyway, it's just, it, that, that's why things, when you look at why, you know, again, it's, it's interesting to me how, how things actually work right. <laughs> once you start learning how the world actually works. Um, but yeah, so in that sense, you know, like Putin, um, like in the parts of uh, Ukraine that they've been uh, annexing, Putin has been forgiving debts, just writing them off. So in that sense, in the original like usage of the word, you know, tyrannus, um, he actually is that. <laughs> well, and, we also we also use the same word when we're talking about our bishop, like we sing, um, we sing, de, we use the word despota, which means the same thing, means tyrant, which means ruler. That's the actual word word for ruler. So. Um, like, but it's a forgiver. It's a ruler is a forgiver. And what does what does a bishop do? You know, they bind they bind and lose sins. You know, they, yeah. they, the prayers of absolution. That's that's actually what a leader is supposed to do, like you know, within the church and also outside of the church. You know, right. it, it's that's 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 the role of a king. You know, there's a right. reason why you have in the Old Testament. The, that's why the, Christ the, is king. Yes. He is the ultimate forgiver of debts. Exactly, and that's yeah. why you have the jubilee in the in the in the Mosaic law. You know, that's. And the, again, it's to prevent this madness. I mean, you can go back to, to ancient Sumerian history, uh, ancient Egypt, and uh, you find regular debt forgiveness because the kings recognized if they didn't have debt forgiveness, then the, everyone would end up in debt to the few creditors who would then control all of society. 
Right. And that's something, you know, I've been reading Livy and that's something that stood out to me. It's um, I look forward to seeing if Machiavelli picks up on it in his discourses on Livy. But the thing that stood out to me is when you had this transition from Rome as uh, being a king, you know, having kings to being uh, having a Senate, you know, forming a republic um, almost straight off the bat. One of the huge recurring issues is the entire all the all the plebeians, all the working people, all the little people end up as debt slaves repeatedly. And this was not a problem during the time that Rome was a kingdom. But once it became a republic, suddenly this becomes a problem. And the Senate, the people are demanding debt forgiveness and the Senate won't give it. So it's just a it's just a, a recurring problem with republics that you see everywhere. You see it in Florence in during the Renaissance period. Yep. It's just repeated and and frankly, uh, you don't see debt forgiveness uh, you only places you see debt forgiveness are in authoritarian systems. So yeah, because only the the, the tyrant can do that. Um, that's actually the the original meaning of social justice because um, Christianity does have a concept of social justice, but it's not this rationalistic concept that we have in the West where we have to like equalize everything. It's a social justice understood from the hierarchical perspective, where the where the the ruler tries to in a way give back to the people what the elites have accumulated over time. It's it's basically the idea that the ruler lives for the people, not not uh, not to only to extract from the people. But uh, I was going to ask, like, because everybody is talking about the need for industrialization as, as a way to um, to recover the, you know, the political autonomy to, you know, have your own country and, and to rule your own country. Uh, but uh, there is this prevailing, let's say, orthodoxy within uh, e e economists and and these new economics uh, thinkers that 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 say that the service sector is the one that uh, brings the most, and I think it has to do with a more maybe maybe I'm too I'm too um, let's say I'm too biased, but it it seems to be related to a bourgeoisie perspective and and like the West becoming too decadent in the sense that the the service sector jobs that they're thinking that uh, will drive the economy are either those in tech, which are very few, because not not everybody can do them, and those that have to do with, uh, let's say, the 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 intellectual workers, like I don't know, um, professionals that go to the university and such. And I think that, uh, like the economy as we know it, doesn't have enough positions to fill in that sense. So oh, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are and if we can shift that uh, that wrong-headed view, uh, because. Uh, we cannot all be, let's say, accountants. Like we, we have to have uh, an industrial base through which to project our own, um, let's say, uh, economic power. So this, this actually, I was reading. I forget who I was reading on this. It might have been Simplicius, but um, and, a couple, and I think also um, Alexander McCree. Um, but putting together what, what I was reading uh, on this, essentially, what you're seeing in the private sector, or what we've seen in the private sector, is the private sector emulating uh, the US federal government. So, in a federal government, you have okay. So, you, let's say you're head of a uh, you know Department of Education or what have you. Your prestige and everything is based on you know how big is your budget, how many people right. do you have working for you, how many do you take your orders. So, you've had this huge bloat of the uh, of the bureaucracy as you just want to fill in bodies. Um, and that, of course, has led to the demand for you know more white collar workers, people rushing to get into college, get those college degrees so you can get that white collar money because there used to be white collar money. I mean, mo anyone here who had a parent in the boomer generation, there's a reason why they were telling you, you got your college degree, you get a job and you're golden. Um, the thing is that the, the conditions that was true 50 years ago, that's it, not true. It hasn't been true since 2007, um, objectively speaking. Um, but uh, what you've had in the corporate world is the same deal. Um, so you have like, the, for example, so if a corporation, if a corp in theory, a corporation seeking to maximize profit, if, if you build a piece of software that's like really good, uh, let's say like Google, you, you build that, you know, the, the, the search engine, uh, Google should not have hired all the, like the tens of thousands of people that they've hired to build all these other products that just lose money. Right. They should have just kept that core team, a few hundred people. And everyone could have been making millions every single year. Uh, and, you know, they could have paid their employees literally millions every single year and, uh, you know, still keep, you know, billions upon billions of profit for themselves. Um, you know, even more profit than what they have right now. But that doesn't happen. Uh, and the reason is because you have within the companies themselves, um, 
again, part of this is because of the debt issue. So uh, most companies you see, they're all dependent on on the debt on the debt markets. You have to have access to the debt stuff. That's why Larry Fink and you know that interview from 2017 or 18, he said that we have to force people to change. So essentially, if you want access to the debt money to stay competitive, you have to take on you know like the DIE stuff, the diversity stuff. Um, otherwise, you don't have access to debt markets. You're not going to be able to compete with your competitors. Uh, you're going to get you're going to lose market share. Um, so given that threat, that's why you've had such bloat in the corporate sector. Like a lot of tech companies were hiring way over hiring. Um, I was, I did work for a big company and it wasn't one of the big, you know, the five, the fang ones, but it was one like just under them in terms of size. Uh, I'll just say that they had an internal search engine that at times was actually faster than Google's. Um, and Google actually would compete against us. Um, but even in that company, like in the division I was in, like when we, we had 40 people in my division and there was always work to do, et cetera. And then I remember when they expanded it out to 160 people, like they hired 120 people in like six months. And then there was actually a point where I ran out of work to do. There was no tickets because everyone was, you had taken them and there was like nothing on the board. And I was like, this is like this expansive way over hiring. Um, yeah, it's, it's just that it's to keep access to that debt money. You keep access to that debt money, you can maintain your market share. So instead of, you know, like is the company is super profitable, you know, it was making nine figures profit. Um, you know, instead of paying people more for the value, finding, you know, those employees who actually do the work that generate the money, that excess money, instead of being kept as profit or used to pay the labor who's actually doing the work, that money is used to build, you know, build out the bureaucracy, build out all these jobs that uh, either A, don't do anything like diversity consultants, uh, you know, HR, bloat expansion. Um, or also uh, to get to pad your diversity stats, you start hiring people who don't have any capacity to do the work, uh, and you you know just but you just have them there so you can say hey we have this percentage that is you know this ethnic group or this percentage of this protected class. Um, that's something that's all over the place, and I've even seen in my own like my own experience when I was interviewing people where like we'd be told like for a certain role uh, we need someone with this demographic background because uh, we want to avoid you know disparate impact. Um, so that, that's where the money is going and that's, um, and <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what's happening within the, within that sector. And that's why you get such crazy white collar bloat and this yep. overvaluation of white collar work. Um, and you combine that with the fact that the American elite themselves have a huge disdain for getting their hands dirty, for actually working with their hands themselves. And you see this even militarily. There's a reason why they always use proxies instead of, you know, trying like, actually doing the work themselves. Like it's not American troops who are being sent, right? At least, I mean, there's some, but it's not like the U.S. military is operating at full force in Ukraine right now. Um, they want to expend as many Ukrainians as they possibly can while the Ukrainian state still exists. Uh, they don't want to have to do the work themselves. Uh, and it's that same disdain of having to do it stuff with your own hands. Um, it's anyway, that, that, that that's, the, yeah. that's, that's the, just, it's a whole host of problems, man. Yeah. I, I want to move, uh, into another direction one moment, but before I want to give a special thank you to Raven wisdom, yoga and other mystical musings, our sister, she's been, uh, ortho curious lately and has been, uh, moving out of some of her occult and new age. And she says, so thankful to see the corruption in the government and the states being exposed publicly here. People around me think I'm a crazy conspiracist. Love to Russia. Well, thank you so much, uh, Raven Wisdom. We wish you uh, the best on your interest and inquiry into orthodoxy. Thank you so much for the generous super chat. And we absolutely agree with you. That's why I think everybody in the live chat would say that the majority of people around them think they're crazy conspiracists, but that's why we're all here because we're not. And this is a community in which we're trying to articulate these things so we can all see that we're on the same page. Um, so Jose and Ivan, we, we kind of got derailed, but I'm, I want to pose it more directly to you guys, especially, uh, Jose, I got two questions. I'll save the second one later. That one's on El Salvador. I'm curious on some of your perspectives on that one. But the first one is we've already some people missed the beginning of the stream. We've already discussed uh, the Russian terror attack. Now what we're going to uh, pose is like, what do you think are some going to be some of the fallouts? We mentioned the allyship, but I'm curious on just just speculating. Obviously, we're just speculating. None of us have privy knowledge here, but I'm curious. What are some of your thoughts on the future in the next maybe this year or in the next few years? So in terms of like 
from that event, the only the only real change is Russia is going to have the death penalty again. Interestingly enough, the, the, the church okayed the death penalty before the uh, or like even like they, they had the synod on um, I forget the synod that they had um, on the, like the social concept when that happened. But you know the church okayed the death penalty before the Duma, and now the Duma has apparently come around. That that's the only real difference. I don't see there is a habit in, in the West of trying to throw uh, the other side off kilter. And that works. That works with. Uh, I'll say that works with Latin Americans. That works with Africans. It doesn't work with Russians. Um, so Russia is going to do the same military plan that they've they've had before. The only real serious change that's happened recently is uh, so Russia was their plan A. Um, current plan A was uh, as of like two weeks ago. The, the plan A was for to essentially keep putting pressure across the entire front, kind of like the the front. I forget the name of it, but the front they did where they collapsed the Austro-Hungarian army in World War One. Mm. You just attack everywhere, apply pressure everywhere, and just as things break down, you 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 know essentially break down the the uh, armed forces of Ukraine until the Ukraine state collapses, right. and then annex Ukraine. Um, but uh, the one thing the United States has done that has caused them to pivot and to decide that they actually have to cross the Dnieper. Uh, because they've now, uh, you know, Shoigu announced they're they now building um, marine units specifically trained for crossing rivers, um, and they're building a flotilla for uh, for a river, uh, river combat and river transport for a uh, amphibious assault across the Dnieper. And the reason is because the United States, France, and Britain are clearly stated that they plan intend to march into Odessa um, if the Ukrainian state collapses. And the reason for that is because the United States has been building a naval base in Odessa, which yep. they intended to use in order to contest the Black Sea and prevent it. You know, it's it, the goal end goal of trying to turn the Black Sea into an American lake, which is absolute hubris to think that they could pull off. But uh, Odessa is an extremely important city in Russian history. Uh, and even in, with the events that happened in 2014, uh, you know, 40 something people were burned to death uh, in Odessa um, by the uh, by the the well. American backed people. Um, so essentially Russia is, has changed. They, they, they're going with one of their plan B, it was be it plan P, plan C, plan D. Um, you know, they have multiple levels of these things, um, but they, they are going to be doing a, a sprint for Odessa. So do you, cause I've seen uh, people debate about this and somebody like uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, he's been um, outright that he doesn't believe that uh, Russia unless provoked or find it uh, necessary for their own national safety um, wants to take over Western Ukraine. They'd rather just take over the Eastern part uh, the Russian speaking territories and come up to with some type of peace agreement so that NATO uh, one that Western half would never become NATO and have that just keep Western Ukraine as a buffer state. What are your thoughts on that? So the, the part of Western Ukraine they definitely they don't want to have their hands on is uh, Galicia and, and was it Volhynia? I forget how you pronounce it, but it's Lvov or Lviv, uh, that city and its surrounding area. Like that, that's the portion that was uh, going back in history. So you had the Union of Brest in the 17th century. That's the portion that went Catholic mm. uh, at that time. So like okay. all this whole conflict uh, goes back to the Union of Brest. So you can, in a sense, blame the Pope. Um, <laughs> the, I always do. Yeah. So <laughs> the. Um, yeah, because frankly, like you look at the, you know, you look at the, the people that the American back, they're all the descendants of the descendants of the Lipkovskyites and uh, and the Banerans were drawn mainly from the uh, from the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Catholic, you know, Byzantine Catholic population, the descendants of they're not actually devout Byzantine Catholics. Uh, they've, they've wholly secularized. And, you know, by the time they were Banderos around, they had wholly secularized. But they are the descendants of those who followed, who abandoned orthodoxy for Rome um yeah you know, at that time so that that's the portion that they don't would not want to have and i know there early was there was consideration of uh i know they're fine with giving like they do want to give the hungarian part to hungary um and they would like to give the romanian part to romania the problem is romania is um what do you call it uh they're not wholly puppeted by the us but the us has a lot of fingers in romania and that now nato is building a massive base so or essentially the united states is building a massive base i saw that in romania so essentially the romanian portion can't be given to Romania and um, the Polish portion sadly can't either because Poland has decided they want to throw themselves wholly in with the Anglo-Americans yet again. Uh, you think they'd have learned their lesson, you know, nine, 80 years, some 80 something years ago. I know there was a, there was a Polak in the comments who was commenting on, uh, you know, what he was concerned, his concerns for Poland. And the fact is uh, 
the British had no intention of honoring Poland whatsoever in World War II. Uh, the Poles are just something the, the Anglo to the Anglo American establishment. The Poles were nothing but cannon fodder. Right. And today, I will tell I can I can assure you one hundred percent the Poles are nothing but cannon fodder to the Anglo American establishment. And it and unfortunately, the reason why Poland is the way it is fundamentally it's spiritual. Uh, it goes back to it, it does go back to the schism. Um, the, the, that's that was the big break between Poland and, and the Rus. Uh, I know Poles who've converted to Orthodoxy, and I can tell you exactly. And yeah, and I can tell you from my own experience, like Poles and Russians are not act the only serious difference between Poles and Russians is the religion. Right. It, when when a Pole becomes Orthodox, like I'll put it this way. So like if an American becomes Orthodox, he's not going to behave like a Russian dude. It's just it's just not going to happen. And it, there are guys who will try to LARP it, but like it's just it's stupid. But having known Poles who've converted to Orthodoxy and been Orthodox for decades. They actually behave like Russians after like a couple of years. And it's just, it's not forced. It's just, they just start behaving the same. It's crazy. Um, and I, I've seen it. Um, so it's, uh, unfortunately, it's that, that spiritual blindness that, you know, the Polish elite, uh, the Polish, <laughs> unfortunately, they throw themselves in, into that. And, you know, as the person mentioned with Romania, you know, it, it's sad because Romania really seriously has an, op has an opportunity to regain ancient territory. And if, you know, if, if if Romanian people decide to be anti-Russia over this and frankly side with the people who handed Romania over to, to communism, because that's what the West did. That was the whole point of world war two. Um, like this gets into what, what was the Anglo American, what was the Anglo American reason for kicking off world war two or trying to engineer it? Cause they wanted to destroy the continent um, and remove, remove a competitor, uh, competitors, plural. Um, yeah, it, it's it's sad to me. It's you know, and I know I, I know Romanians too. And as you mentioned, I know a few who are aware of what's going on, but most aren't. Um, you know, it's 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 sad. It, it really is. So yeah, in terms of like, um, yeah, they're 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 forced to go for Odessa, and I think they're going to be forced to take central Ukraine. Uh, the only question is what they're going to do about the westernmost parts of Ukraine that are you know Benderan, you know Bandera's territory, Bandera's land, and frankly the the portion that's the most Catholic. Right. Um, and unfortunately, given how Poland's behaving, you know, it, they're, that would be the best solution for them to go with Poland. Uh, but but you know, with Donald Tusk, I mean, it's it's EU, you know, NATO's taken over Poland. They at least did have yep. a nationalist prime minister earlier. Now Donald Tusk is put in place and he's literally just a mouthpiece for every global talking point. And his recent one just what was it, like a week or two ago was criticism of the the congressional republicans that didn't want to send any more to money to ukraine and talking about how they're they're you know they're, they're going to be held guilty and responsible for all the deaths and the in the lives of the ukrainians that are going to perish because they won't send us more money it's like dude you're in poland dude shut up mm -hmm. <laughs> like and we all know that 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 election was probably rigged but as soon as they became in power and like now they're promoting lgbtq we know the polish people do not support a lot of that stuff an attack on Catholicism. So, you know, I've, I'm sympathies to all the Poles and uh, the Polish people out there. I wish you guys the best. Well, yep. I, I kind of agree with Jose in the sense that I think that um, what will happen with Western Ukraine is that it will not be annexed uh, straight up, but that Russia will probably end up uh, setting up like a uh, stooges like to and and that's what any kind of ruler with a, some sense would do, which is basically you have to set up people who will be sort of sympathetic, if not loyal to your own interests, which was the status quo that used to be before the before NATO started meddling with uh, with Ukraine, because basically uh, Putin ha is, is, is angry that uh, the U.S. Uh, tried to co-opt Ukraine and uh, the Western Ukrainians, they're, they're kind of um, salty because they didn't get the economic opportunities that uh, the West offered them, uh, as opposed to, let's say, Russia or the USSR. And um, I think that with Romania, the issue is that Romania is very poor. And even though they're very orthodox and quite devout, I wouldn't say like uh, comparatively as devout as the, as the Serbians or, or other countries, they're pretty devout. The problem is that they're so poor that they see the West as being a, a way, they want to modernize. And that, that's kind of the, the, the problem we're dealing with uh, with the East. I think what, what will happen uh, is that uh, Russia will be able to establish like a, a, a sphere of influence 
And this will be memory hold in the sense that uh, Western countries don't have the willpower nor the, nor the, let's say, the interest of keeping this fresh in the sense that they will try to downplay it and now they will try to save face in the sense that I think that a Ukrainian loss is inevitable and the rulers themselves don't have the political will or the political uh, capital to, to send troops. And, and uh, the, the, let's say, whatever well-meaning uh, citizens uh, wanted to do to help Ukraine, it has run out. Like nobody wants to send any more money both in the US, both in, and I hear it all the time here in Spain, that uh, there's a lot of criticism of any kind of talk of uh, trying to, let's say, save democracy and those kinds of things. Like people are not buying that, uh, that spiel anymore. So probably what will happen is that the, the, the West will, uh, let's say, have to eventually uh, roll back. I don't know what would be the new center. And, and that would be my question to you. But uh, what, I, what I want to know, at least from a, from a, let's say, more mundane perspective, is what will happen to us in a, in a demographic and societal sense? Because I don't see the people who are pushing these uh, agendas, even though they might shut up for a little while, a couple of years. Like wh wh what I have seen is liberals in the, in the economic sense and neocons like trying to make things work but things aren't are falling apart and there's like a, a new let's say faction that hasn't yet fully let's say manifested politically and and i'm afraid that this new faction will not be able to uh let's say coalesce in a way that that becomes a representative of let's say a, a western nations recovering some sort of identity or 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 a true north in the sense of like the the project that people like donald trump wanted to do like make their own countries good again i don't know uh, jose maybe you have some uh, some opinion yeah you mentioned that. a question earlier ivan within yeah. that uh yeah. what, what was, what the, was question? the question you had for yeah. jose what 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 will happen to us demographically in the sense that like we're ruined in, in economic terms uh, we're ruined in cultural terms like the west uh, doesn't seem to want to change the way it operates in an economic sense like I see yeah. it all the time with the with the big uh, companies. Like, what will happen to these people that don't want to leave, for example, their white collar jobs? That they don't want to, let's say, foster industrialization and such. Got it. Um, yeah. No. What, what's going to happen in, in in the U.S. and in uh, you know Germany, France, and England is you're going to see elites fighting each other as they try to hold on to the few scraps that are left that are quickly vanishing. Right. Um, and unfortunately, we're all going to get to be, you know, small little minnows watching the giant whales fighting each other. Right. Um, what I will say is in terms of location, um, you know, it's a rule like, you know, uh, St. Anthony the Great, you know, said, you know, don't be in a rush to move. Uh, you know, to, it's, you know, Orthodox don't flee. I mean, there can be a reason to move. Right. I mean, one is I'll, I'll actually give one example. I know I've shared it before, the example of like the Anglo-Saxons who moved to the Roman Empire so they could get access to the sacraments. When Spain was subjugated, uh, when it was Romanized in 10, you know, 1080 Council of Burgos, mm -hmm. there were some communities that rejected the uh, rejected Ro the Roman innovations as heresy. And they continued on for about 200 more years. However, they all died out. And the reason is because they were mostly in the hill country, you know, rural, hard to get places uh, that were not being enforced. So they couldn't re really be cracked down on by, uh, you know, um, you know, the kings of Aragon, Castile, etc., but uh, they all died out, and the, and the reason is because, you know, one, they had no priests, they had no bishops, they had no access to the sacraments whatsoever, and they stayed there, and essentially you just have people doing reader services for a century or two, and then, you know, <laughs> their descendants uh, end up getting absorbed into, you know, Spanish Catholicism. Right. So that that's that's where the... Uh, Let mommy know, okay? Thank you. So th that is where, that's where you do move. Like, if, if you, you know, it's, right. you, know, you got to get your kids baptized, you got to get access to the, to, to, to you know... You yeah. got to get access to, 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 you know, the body and blood of Christ. Um, and, you know, I think it was uh, St. Peter the Galician is an example of a saint that people can look up. If you want to see an example of a saint who moved so that he could get access to the sacraments and, you know, he became a saint from it. Um, but in terms of if you're looking for a location in the U.S. and where you're at, a great way to evaluate is look at what your local elites are doing. 
So uh, some places are easy. So like, you know, Maine, Maine and uh, New Brunswick are ruled by the Irving family. So look at what the Irving family are doing. You know, it's they, they control that state and that uh, and that province of uh, Canada completely um, in, in, in all the in, at the state and, and provincial level of government. So they're going to control that place after the U.S. and Canada fall. Um, so it's like, you know, do you like being ruled by this? Do you like how that family runs that state and province right now? And, you know, they're going to be running it the same way after the federal government ceases to matter. Um, if you're looking at in terms of like things of like, for example, like food security. So like I know recently Oregon is cracking down and they're trying to shut down all family run farms. Uh, the reason they want to do that, I mean, officially it's for climate change, but the real reason is they want to concentrate all those family farms into corporate conglomerates, which can pay a lot heavier tax burdens. So that's an example of an elite that cares about cash flow, not about uh, actual uh, um, real economy. They care, they care about a financialized economy that they're trying to protect. They're not trying to protect a real economy. Uh, the exact opposite would be Texas, where you have a, a very generous agricultural exemption, where they actively promote uh, small-scale ranching, farming, et cetera, because that improves the food, se food security of Texas. Um, and that's, so that's something to, you know, be, you know, to look at and be aware of, like, what is it, you know, so if you live in a place like Illinois, you know, you know, it's, it's not necessarily like abandon the state, but look, even look at your own local county. So like, even like, like Texas, you know, like, do you want to live, you know, in Austin, um, for example, or and if you, if you, let's say you're going to stay in Austin, like that, that's, you know, that, that's where your home parish is. That's where you're going to stay. Uh, be smart in terms of what part of the city you actually live in. Like, for example, I was running from a good friend of mine for a, you know, a few years. And then, um, it was, I mean, this is when I was dating my, no, this is before I was dating my wife actually, but looking around my neighborhood, I realized, you know, a third of the third of the houses, like in that little area had, um, had the, the logo, not the logo, but the, the, what do you call that F phrase of, um, you know, not catchphrase, but whatever you call it, like, uh, a catchphrase associated with a North American man, boy, love association. So I knew for sure there is no way that, you know, even if I was going to stay in Austin, that there's no way I would stay in that part of that, of, of that city. So that's, that's what I mean. Like, you know, be smart in terms of where you're going to be putting your roots down. So if you're going to stay in Indiana or Illinois or New York, whatever it is, if it's a blue state or a red state, um, you know, if, if you're in a red County in a blue state, you know, if, if, and you have intact, intact communities, you know, and you have a local, you know, and you live in a County that's uh, food independent, you know, just things to consider. And also consider like how far are you from, for example, uh, you know, cartel, cartel uh, you know, supply lines um, and, and their transportation lines. That, that's another thing that, you know, things to consider. Just look and see what is the reality of how things are around you. Right. W when the U.S. falls apart, it's not just going to be like, all right, now the 50 states are independent. Like the U.S., if you look at the collapse of the Western Roman Empire uh, and you project that onto the United States, the United States is going to collapse into like 400 something political entities. Granted, one of them is going to control about 20 percent of uh, the population and land mass. And I suspect Texas is trying to be that, you know, that t one big hegemon out of the group. Um, but the other 80 percent, like California is not going to hold together. So if you're in a red part of California, like and exactly, you know, if your parish is there, your family's there, you're in, you know, the state of Jefferson, as they some of the, for example, then, you know, it's probably worth staying. I mean, you, you, you don't you don't necessarily need to, to flee. Um, but you might want to start learning. So how do you live my, how do you live your life? Like things you want to start asking yourself is how do I live my life where I'm less dependent on what the federal government gives or what the state government gives, gives, or even what your local government does. Right. Um, that, that, that's, you want to start thinking about too, like, you know, in terms of like your money, um, the, the vote that does count is what you do with your money. Are you, are you buying, are you prioritizing buying local and by buying local, are you buying from other people who are Orthodox? Are you primarily trying to, focus your, your business with, uh, you know, doing business with people in your parish. Uh, are you focusing on, uh, you know, so like, you know, I, I have a rule of like, you know, can I get it in my parish? And most times for me, it's no, but you know, can, can I then get it within my County? And if not, can I get it within, you know, the, the specific part of Texas that I'm in? Cause Texas is huge. And if not, then can I get it within Texas? And if not, then, okay, start looking outside and right. you know, it, that, that, that's what you want to start thinking of. Like if for people who are minnows, so there's, there's on a macro scale, there's nothing that you really can influence on, on the micro scale. There's a lot that you can do if you're invested in a location and you've built relationships there. Um, so, and also the fact is, you know, for those looking to flee to Russia, um, the window on that is more or less closed. The time to do that, frankly, was 2014. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do agree with that. I think it's going to be harder and harder for Westerners to get into Russia. David in the chat mentioned that it's a reasonable 
consideration to move to Russia, plenty of farmland and stuff. I agree. You're going to have to learn the language. You're going to have to assimilate to the culture. Um, but that, uh, you know, unless you find a way to get in through uh, another country, be it Turkey or something like that, to fly in, it's going to be difficult. But I had a quick question. So side note, who's the who's the big families that control, let's say, the state of Indiana? Do you know so anything any Indiana, I don't know. I know Maine. I know New Mexico because New Mexico is fascinating because uh, they have the same the same families that control New Mexico are, are the same families that ruled it uh, when it was New Spain. Um, it's it's one of the few like new Spanish elites that still exist today, um, and that's why like when that whole fiasco happened with the governor was trying to ban like people holding you know having guns on them uh, completely in in Santa Fe. When that whole thing blew up, people a lot of Americans looked at that like you know left wing versus right wing or rural versus um, versus city. The significance of what happened in New Mexico when you had um, the legislature, members of the legislature and um, all, all these officials refusing to enforce or go along with her. The thing you got to take to account is, one, she's a blood relative of half the people in the legislature. Two, she is um, related by marriage to the other half of the legislature. Um, oh, wow. It's because you had 32 families that ruled New Mexico when it was Nuevo Mexico, you know, in, in Nueva España. And they still rule that state to get today. Uh, an example, you know, they, they lost Arizona to the Americans. It's, it's ruled by Americans, but, you know, or was uh, post annexation. But, um, you know, they still control New Mexico. And that, that's why, like, that literally that whole thing that was going down, it was not a left versus right. It was not rural versus urban. It was literally a giant, massive family squabble that's happening because for some reason, the family heads have decided to abandon the wisdom of their ancestors and have a woman as the head of the freaking clans, which is absolutely stupid. So yeah. Anyway, so if you live in New Mexico, anyway, that's yeah. So in Indiana, I don't know. And that's something you can look into. And yeah, start... I'm going to now that you, you yeah. stir, you've stirred a research topic that I'll probably be diving into this evening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just to so, look at families and who, who does have the most wealth and power and influence in Indiana. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so in Texas, Texas is hard. I'm learning, starting to learn Texas, but Texas is huge. You know, a yeah. place like Maine or New Mexico or like some of the, you know, like Alberta or New Brunswick, these are very easy. Like if you live in a small state, it's going to be very, very easy to learn where the power is. Uh, and it tends to concentrate very quickly, like Idaho be an example. Um, and, um, you know, in the case of uh, Texas, it's much more widespread. And it's strange because Texas is weird. So Maine, it's like very like Anglo-Saxon machine politics, for lack of a better term. So the idea that people have like, oh, like prior to my mass migration and everything that, you know, the Anglo-America was uh, this like ideal uh, republic. Uh, no, just look at Maine. Even uh, what's his name? Like Colonel, uh, was it Joshua Chamberlain? The guy who, you know, Gods and Generals and uh, Gettysburg movies. He's one of the main characters in that. You know, even he found out that um, he, there was a mob that he managed to stop. And it was a mob of like ruling, like ruling class people in Maine. And that was when he realized that uh, democracy and the Republic of Maine itself was a joke and that uh, these men actually offered him, uh, I forget if they offered him governorship or senatorship, but they could install him like that. And he realized they could actually install him like that. Wow. And he, he turned it down. Um, so it's just so. But yeah, it's it's fascinating because I like comparing how Anglo-Saxons do machine or do uh, how angle well frankly how does an anglo-saxon republican a republic actually work versus how does a hispanic republic actually work and that's my, why I've, I've been doing research with new mexico and maine because i want to do that for you know my own my own research stuff and also because texas is weird because you have both going on at the same time so things get really really weird and then you get the carpetbaggers who are you know who were also uh, very exploitative of, of uh, not just of the of the tejano population but also of their fellow um well not really fellow, but you know, the Dixie population. So in Mexico, Texas is a, is a interesting mess in terms of where the power lies. We got a, we got a couple quick questions directed at uh, Jose, but Ivan, I'm going to bring you in in just a second. We're going to be talking about Central America and South America. I know you got insight into that. Uh, people are asking, uh, first one was, how do you find this out about your state? Uh, you've intrigued a lot of people to do further research in regards to their states. All right. So, Learning your state's history, it requires learning history. So my advice actually is don't try to go for that straight off the bat. It's kind of like, okay, if a guy enters into the church and he's struggling, you know, he's got a, you know, full-blown porn addiction, which is, you know, extremely common, uh, you know, don't start trying to, you know, rush for hesychasm uh, first, uh, like, let's, kill, let's kill the basic problem. So the thing is, <laughs> I, in terms yeah. of, I'm of the opinion that news, like news and the public school, uh, not just public school, but even like private education, because they all have to be accredited. 
a lot of what is called education in the United States is totally harmful for the soul and it blinds your ability to actually see how things work. Mm. So like in the, you know, again, you know, you know, how like, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the church, you know, the fathers teach that's, you know, how does one restrain is particularly, you know, the passion of lust, how does one restrain it? You, you restrain your stomach. And so by fasting, uh, honestly, like if, if you really want to go down that path and start recognize being able to recognize patterns to where you can recognize, oh, this is where the power actually lies. This is where the decision centers actually are. Uh, what I strongly recommend is actually not consuming any news whatsoever like for a solid three years, like don't <laughs> consume any mass media whatsoever and even avoid films and stuff. And ironically, this is something, there's something my parents gave me. Um, and then it comes down to, you want to fill it, but it's not enough to just fast from that stuff. Like just like how when the fast during Lent that which you're in, you're supposed to pray more. You're supposed to do good works, etc. You got to fill it in with something. So what are you going to fill it in with? You want to fill it in with good stuff. So obviously, you know, taking orthodox position here, you know, make sure you're reading the lives of the saints, lives of the saints, make sure you're reading uh, the scriptures and make sure you read a little bit of the fathers. You know, don't, if, if you're not that bright, don't just, don't rush into St. Maximus the Confessor. You know, you can read St. John Damascene, you can read St. John Chrysostom, you know, take something simpler. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, and of course, read, read, you know, a little bit of the modern saints, a little bit of the ancient saints as well. Um, and, you know, so assuming you have that baseline where you're, you're cleansing, you know, the spiritual side of the equation, uh, that's where you get into reading stuff that actually, that is actually, you know, educative now. So I know, um, father Peter here criticizes the idea of, you know, the great books. Uh, and I agree with him that, you know, in the West they're idolized and they're, they're overemphasized. Um, but there is truth to like, the way that while you're developing this, your spirit, your the news and the soul, you want to be developing your mind, um, as well. Um, and that's, you know, reading the greats. And of course, you know, some easy ones, you know, if, you know, being Orthodox, you know, read Dostoevsky, you'll learn a lot about how people, you know, a lot about how people actually function. Um, you, you'll notice that the archetypes that he has in his books, they exist everywhere. You know, you, right. you, re you read, uh, you read notes from the underground, you understand how revolutions happen. You read demons, you understand how revolutions happen. Uh, you read Brothers Karamazov, you understand how the lack of fatherhood destroys and, and atomizes civilization. Um, and yep. that's, so that's, that's just looking at, you know, the good fiction in this case, you know, fiction is not, you know, fantasy in the sense of like just made up stuff, but, um, teaching truths about how the human condition in a narrative form. Um, you know, that's what Dostoevsky is. That's what even, even Tolstoy is. And, um, and also look at, you know, the greats too in the West. So, you know, Dickens, uh, and, uh, uh Tolkien, um, you know, and, and Lewis specifically his, if you want to know, like, how does the West Anglo-American empire function, I do strongly recommend uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. Even if one want, you know, you let's say you're someone who's used to reading nonfiction and you want to, you know, take on, you know, Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. Honestly, you'll learn a lot about how things actually function just by reading C.S. Lewis's Cosmic Space Trilogy. The entire that that trilogy breaks down and it gives a bird's eye view of someone who's being inducted into the power structure uh, of the British Empire. And Lewis's details, everything there is spot on. And it's done in a format which is entertaining and easy to read. It's not super dry, you know, like like a like you know nonfiction of Quigley. Right. But that that's the that's the value of reading, you know, solid good you know good stuff. <laughs> and so then of course, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I didn't want to cut you off if you're in yeah. the middle of something. And then at that point, you know, if you're reading, you know, if you're reading, you know, these, you know, uh, like good fiction or you know good literature, then you can start working in uh, nonfiction stuff. Uh, and of course, like if you want to know how a republic works, so as you mentioned, like how do you learn about how these state republics works? So right now I'm, I'm reading Livy, and the reason I'm reading Livy is because the most important work by Machiavelli is his discourses on Livy. If you want to know how a republic actually works, if you want to know the fundamentals of how power actually operates in every you know every level of government in the United States, or and it applies to France, applies to Germany, anywhere where you don't have um, an actual explicit masculine you know authoritarian aristocracy. Uh, discourses on Livy, it's, it's, it's a breakdown of how you will understand how things actually function, uh, after, after reading that book and studying that book. So that, that's, that's what I I've recommend. Read that. And then, I need to dive into that. I yeah, have not read and, that. Yeah. And it's, uh, and of course, you know, reading the history that is derived from, you know, read Livy and that's where like I was, I'm reading Livy now. And, uh, and then I re I noticed patterns and I'm like, Oh, look at that. You know, you have this issue that once Rome becomes a Republic, people keep becoming debt slaves. Um, you know, so patterns like that. And you, Again, during this whole time, don't be consuming media, and you know, and any and even and even alternative media. Like, there's a point where you need to take a break. You need to learn. You need to you need to fill your stuff. You need to fill your system with good stuff. 
that, that's that's the idea. Like you do do that for a solid, you know, if you can do that for a solid three years, like you'll you'll re- one. I mean, you're gonna realize your your wavelength of how you're thinking is completely different from everyone around you uh, when you're disconnected that way. I mean, I'll put it this way: like as a kid. So the thing is, it was when I was eight years old. My mother did the best thing for me ever. Uh, she literally threw the television out the window, and this was a second story window. Uh, and she said, no, you're just going to read and you're not going to watch TV anymore. Uh, that, that's <laughs> so that that's, that's the, honestly, it really is like the whole purpose of mass media is to prevent you from knowing stuff. You read, if you read like the, the letters of, uh, CS, like civil war, American civil war, uh, you know, soldiers, guys with a sixth grade education, like these guys were better educated than, you know, your PhDs today. Right. And it, it, it's frightening. It's, it truly is frightening. Like, don't get me wrong. Like guys with a PhD, they'll know a lot about a civic thing. But that yep. average, average, the average Civil War soldier, North and South, with a sixth grade education, understood how to think. Right. And Agreed. that's, and that's, and these are, and these are Protestants, you know, and some Catholics. And yes, there was like three Orthodox people involved, but you know, it's that, it's the thing. It's like, um, I, I, you have no idea. Like you truly, people, people look at like the fifties or the eighties or even like people idle, you know, lamenting the nineties. Like you won't, un, you will have, you do not have any idea what you have lost from your ancestors. And, but after you do this, like you will start seeing it and uh, you know, but also you'll start seeing what, what your people can, can return to. Like, you know, right. I know we had this discussion before of like, you know, the future of uh, orthodoxy in America. And the fact is like, yeah. So, you know, uh, America is neo-Protestant. It's not even really Protestant. It is a neo-Protestant nation. But, you know, when you're reading the lives of the saints, you read, you know, St. Chad, you read in, in particular, you know, St. Alec- uh, Saint, uh, uh, Saint King Alfred the Great. Um, you'll see what your people contributed, you know, to the kingdom of heaven. Right. And what can be contributed to the kingdom of heaven again. And that's that's why, again, like, what what is it What is it that, uh, you know, people think about, I know those are those, uh, previous live stream we had where people are asking like, you know, what point do you use violence against, you know, the people ruling you, you don't one, it, it's going to be counterproductive because you know, one, you know, the people asking these questions, I assure you have not fasted, you know, they, they, they haven't filled their stuff. They haven't thought uh, they haven't even developed the ability to think properly yet. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the, when you look at like, honestly, like if you look at, I mean, at this point, you know, not looking at the media, what are the things that the ruling class of America are truly terrified by? And you look at their response to NoFap. They're absolutely terrified that young men will stop self-abusing. Right. They're absolutely terrified True. if young men stop watching porn. Yep. And I can tell you from my own experience, like you watch porn, I get stupider. If yep. I watch it, I get stupider. Like just straight up, my IQ points drop. My that's ability, to, my, my reading speed drops and I notice it. Yep. And that's, that's the other part. And also to get better at reading, you have to read to get faster. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's... So that's what they're terrified of. They're terrified of men who, you know, go to the gym because apparently, you know, go, that's why they're you're describing, you know, if you, if man lifts weights, that's, you know, a right, you know, radi- a sign of radical right wing. Yeah, extremism. Right. Yep. They're terrified of men actually using their bodies. They're terrified of men who will work with their hands. They're terrified of, you know, again, there's the whole the issue of all these ruling elite having white collar jobs. They don't know how to use their hands. And they're terrified of these people, men who have skills, even if they're underpaid in the U.S., they're terrified of men who have skills that they don't have and they have no way of obtaining. That's right. That that's the gist of it. And they're terrified of you, you know, getting married to uh, a godly woman and having children and raising them. They're they're absolutely terrified every single time that someone is having procreative sex within marriage. That yep. just that absolutely terrifies them. Like it doesn't take much. Like the fact is, yes, okay. So there was a, a certain tribe that took over U.S. Um, a lot of the U.S. government in, uh, in two thousand. But the fact is, like, even even the a lot of the wasp elite go along with the the neocons, uh, you know, like Lindsey Graham and others. Uh, the fact is, the only restraint in the United States in its history since its revolution has been the moral fortitude of its people, uh, of the ruled people. Like the state itself was uh, wholly Masonic and frankly Antichrist in its construction. Yeah, but the people were not. Uh, the people. The, you know, you had Puritans who, you know, granted crazy, but they were serious about their faith. You had, uh, you know, the Amish in Pennsylvania, very serious about their faith. You Even the Episcopalians back then, you know, they were very serious about their faith. Uh, the Baptists, et cetera, even the Neo-Protestants. And that's that was the restrainer was, you know, the, the ruling class could only get away with so much. Um, but as as the more morality within the United States decreased, that's where the the ruling elite were able to put pedal to the metal to be able to instigate and drag the United States into a World War One, a World War Two, mm. 
into mm. into the Cold War. You know, like for example, like you know, J.P. Morgan was huge in funding the Bolsheviks, and his successors after he died, you know, successfully funded that revolution. Um, the only reason that could happen then was because you know the moral decay that was happening, you know, by the turn of the you know 19, 1900 that didn't exist in the year eighteen hundred, and that's that's something to take into account. Like really, like if you want to oppose the evil that rules, you know, your you know the empire and rules your nation. You know, be you of Dixieland or, or, or you know, Puritan progeny, um, you know, or Midwest German. Honestly, the best possible thing you can do is ma is fighting your own passions. Yep. I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. Well, that was a long, uh, long winded <laughs> answer for how you find out who your ruling family is in your state. But I agree with everything you said and you put it you put it together so well, man. Uh, I think everybody in the chat is really impressed with your knowledge of recall and the amount of books you've read. And that's something that all of us are called to uh, to, to grow our perspective and our knowledge base and especially history. That, that's something that I talk about a lot is that if you don't know history, you're you have amnesia. You're a person that doesn't remember the past and you're totally manipulable and you really can't as you're highlighting, you know, by um, sort of withdrawing from mainstream media and movies or whatever it may be um you are reacquiring a perspective that has some type of historical basis to it because most people are totally led like a donkey with a carrot before them and it's the next pleasure it's the next pleasure it's the next pleasure and they have no no sense of understanding of of how things occur and therefore they can't connect the dots or see the patterns as you mentioned you mentioned that you know eventually you'll begin to see the patterns but to see the patterns, as you said, you have to, in a way, not move. You have to stand still. You have to grow and build a foundation of knowledge. And most people just have no foundation at all. And it's I, this is a real problem, I think, with a lot of Americans, particularly the difference between your average Russian and the average American is the historical perspective the person has based on who they are, and what they view as their identity. And unfortunately, because America is such a recent country and because of the consumerism, the rampant capitalism and materialism, they have no understanding of, of the historical situation that everything's occurred in. I mean, it, it's really sad. But anyways, I want to transition to a topic that uh, Ivan, thank you, brother, um, about uh, El Salvador. So somebody wanted to know your guys's perspectives on um, was it Bukele? Uh, what, how do you pronounce the last name of, is it Bukele? What's the, how do you pronounce it? Bukele. Okay. So I was pretty close. I, I'll take it. Um, what are your guys' thoughts? Cause I just saw recently that he just, uh, enacted a new initiative, sent like 5,000 soldiers to, I think it was the Northern part of El Salvador to sort of eradicate the rest of the gangs there. And we've been talking a lot about, well, earlier we mentioned about the, the dominancy of the Western Hemisphere by the United States, and he was recently here for like a TPUSA uh, speaking event or something like that. And he was, again, pretty insightful. I mean, nothing that we haven't articulated, but a, a head of state, small state, but at least a head of state articulating these things and telling America like what's getting ready to come for him. I thought was insightful. Now I've heard other people speculate differently about him. I'm curious what your guys' perspective is being entrenched in, uh, Spanish culture. What What are your guys' thoughts on Bukele and El Salvador? I'll let Jose go first. Uh, but my only small comment is that he's like a pseudo Christian. Like he he wants to be a Christian, but he he kind of likes it like a deist likes Christianity. You know, uh, like okay. I wholly agree with Ivan on that. So the thing is, so yeah, he is um, he is a de facto strong man, and he's interesting because he's a strong man who that's operating independent of the United States, and that's the first in long, long time. The last one was, uh, frankly, I think would be Porfirio Diaz. I mean, excluding you know Castro, um, but yeah. So it's um, yeah. In terms of like, so him in particular, like, no, what he's doing is great, and he does show the fact. He does show how you know, frankly. Uh, <laughs> Voting is a joke. I mean, party politics is a joke. If you really want a functioning society, uh, society needs a father, king, uh, you know, strong man in this case. Uh, the problem is, uh, in case of El Salvador, and I think it, there's a spiritual element there. Whoa. Uh, whoops. Yeah. So there's a spiritual element at play because El Salvador, of course, is, you know, the savior. That's what it means. And so the strong man that's come to power. Um, so Bukele's father was a convert to Islam. Uh, he built the first mosque there in El Salvador. Oh, I did not know that. Um, and he is very cagey about what his faith actually is. 
And so that, that's just what sets up a lot of spiritual red flags for me. You know, of course, you know, as a Christian, if I was in El Salvador, you know, honor the king. So, you know, honor, honor the, you know, strong men that's there. But I, I wouldn't, um, there, there's a, there's a level of um, messianism, which uh, I, I find uh, concerning. Um, you know, one should approach, you know, these things, you know, one can be grateful for, you know, if, if you have a, you know, even, even if you had like an evil man as, as, as ruler, but he rules well, you know, one can be grateful for that. Right. Um, but the fundamentally, it's not going to be, it's not the long-term solution for El Salvador, because the fact is, you know, strong man rule is just, you know, who's going to be the next strong man. Um, you don't get stable succession until you get monarchy, but you don't get monarchy unless you have uh, the altar. So like the, the temples preceded Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh could not function without without the temples. That's why that's why like you know if you read in uh, Genesis, uh, you know Joseph didn't tax the temples. Uh, it's because that was the base like that that was the base of Pharaoh's uh, ability to have you know cl claim to you know successful you know if people if people recognize the one ruler as being chosen by God or in this case a Pharaoh being a God, uh, you kind of need the the priests on your side and also to ensure say what do you call it um, succession that uh, works because the, the weakest point of uh, of any of any of any type of form of government be it elected or be it a uh, um, you know heter hereditary monarchy is or or a dictatorship military dictatorship like a Saddam Hussein it's succession um, and you know it's that that that's and that's where the religion play comes in that's why monarchy historically even like in ancient Sumeria or China or Japan uh, you look at the Japanese dynasty that's ruled for you know forever um i think the longest running dynasty of all time and you know it's it's without without shinto buddhism um you know that they're, they're they would not have had such a stable you know stable millennia of succession in japan mm -hmm. so that that's the fundamental problem with with el salvador it is a band-aid kind of the way that porfirio diaz was a band-aid in mexico like as a as an independent state as an independent republic um mexico's height was porfirio diaz um and after the u.s knocked him out and what, what year was that uh, that would be late 19th, early 20th century. Um, one of Porfirio Diaz's claims to fame, which I found amazing, is uh, he actually figured out he was the he himself actually figured out how to mass produce the first semi-automatic rifle. Um, so it was a, the Mondragon, which was a Mexican. He didn't invent the semi-automatic. It was a German who did that. But, you know, a Mexican guy actually beat the Germans to how to mass produce them. Oh, so Dragon was the first mass produced semi-automatic rifle and the Mexican army was the first army to use semi-automatic rifles because of that. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, he was seen as a threat, partially that too, because he was a brilliant guy, um, you know, and so he was knocked out by the US. Um, you had the Mexican revolutions, etc. And uh, Mexico turned to a bloodbath led to uh, Calles and the Cristero War, which is something that I'm going to pay you at some point to do a, a sponsored stream on. So it's... Um, yeah, but it's it's sad. I mean, I look at I look at what Mexico is now, and I know what it could have been. And uh, it's even sadder I mean, if you go before Porfirio Diaz, what it was as New Spain. Um, you know, Mexico City was a, it was it was second only to Venice in terms of beauty. It was a canal city like Venice. Uh, and when the you know when you had the revolutionary government take over, and you had the um, you know essentially the Masonic gripping of Mexico or enslavement of Mexico. Um, you know, they, they drained, they drained the canals. They, they paved over everything. They introduced brutalist architecture in the, in the early 19th century, you know, before, you know, before 1860, you had brutalist architecture in, in Mexico city. Uh, they just uglified everything. So it's, it's again, you know, it's what I said before, you have no idea how much you've lost. And Porfirio Diaz was a pushback against that. And, you know, he did do take steps to beautify Mexico city again, but you know, Mexico city, you know, it was like a silver age for lack of a better term compared to the golden age of new Spain. And uh, now, you know, Mexico City is sinking into the lake and it does not, you know, the lake bed, the dried lake bed. Uh, and frankly, the city's in a serious, you know, has serious ecological issues that all are downstream from revolutionaries thinking that they can do things better than how their ancestors did and wanted to no longer have a city that was on a lake or on a, on a body of water like Venice. And uh, of course, also that's tied to the hatred of beauty. Because beauty, beauty is an energy of God. It's something that God. Uh, I totally know. agree with that. So it's, um, yeah, and so like you know, I look, so I look at, I look at, I look at El Salvador. I look at uh, Bukele, kind of like Porfirio Diaz, except that spiritually he's not as strong as Porfirio Diaz, and that, that's the main red flag there. Um, and there is no long-term stable solution for Latin America until Latin. I mean, to, until Hispanidad, frankly, solves our the issue of faith. 
um, you know, just to, just to take an example, again, going to Colombia, um, the fact is the Venezuelan state will outlast the Colombian state. Um, at this point in Colombia, like 84% of all children are being raised by single mothers. Oh my um, gosh. So the, the state has no future. It will not exist in 30 years. Uh, that irony is, so people talk about, you wow. know, frankly, neoliberalism is worse than communism. Uh, the, the states, I mean, granted, don't get me wrong, family serious issues in Venezuela, but it's nowhere near as bad as Colombia and the Venezuelan state will outlast the Colombian state because Colombia embraced neoliberalism. Venezuela went with communism, two different types of errors, you know, as you know, to refer to, you know, um, Peter, father, Peter hears or, or father, uh, um, who also uses this phrase a lot. Um, I forget, but you know, he has another podcast, but you know, the idea of the error of the right error of the left, um, you know, two different errors and they have different, different results in the case of, you know, Venezuela, you get starvation, uh, for a time. And then in the case of Colombia, you have complete and total state collapse and destruction of the family. Wow. Um, and all of this, of course, is downstream of Vatican II. And the fact is, you know, you can, you know, people, I know there are people who are, you know, I understand, you know, the, the, you know, hard Orthodox apologetic against Romanism. Um, but the fact is, uh, pre Vatican II, Roman Catholicism did provide, frankly, a civilizing force. It did support the family the same way, like, you know, Shinto Buddhism in, in Japan did for a long time underneath the emperors. Um, Post Vatican II, uh, the amount of moral decay is just, it's it, it can, it, it's it's everywhere and it's um that's why like it you know a strong a strong man's not going to be able to reverse that himself um uh, that that's an issue of faith that's an issue of, of spirit which is um is fundamentally that is what has to be solved before you start seeing a re for, for lack of a better term like a a, a reintegrating hispanic entity mm. um and to put an example if you want an example from orthodox history that, that would be russia you know you had you had, uh, you know, the, the Rus, and they were shattered by the Mongols into like two dozen states, just yep. as Hispanidad was shattered into two dozen states by the Masonic revolutions, which were funded by Britain in the United States. Um, the difference <laughs> was Russia, despite all that shattering, was still unified in faith. And that it was that unity of faith which brought them all back together. And that's where you get, you know, for example, if you want a saint to look up, uh, St. Dmitry Donskoy and uh, St. Ser Sergei of Rodonezh, who was the one who uh, blessed them in that action. Saint Sergei Vrodonezh was a is a saint who is the closest you can get to to pacifism without being a pacifist. He really, really despised war, and in the end, he blessed Dmitry Donskoy to go to to go to battle because there was no every other option had been um, exercised, and there was there was. But yeah, the point is that the battle that the, uh, Saint Dmitry Donskoy led uh, the Rus onto when they when they went into that battle, um, they came in as a bunch of different you know members of different principalities. When they came back, they came back as Russians. Right. Um, and that is, and so Russia pulled together in a way that, you know, the Western Roman empire did not pull together. And part of that, again, main, personally for me, if, if you break it all the way down, yeah, there are geopolitical reasons, there are economic reasons, issues with debt cycles that were happening in the West that were not happening in the East, but you boil it all down to the bottom level. And it's, it's a spiritual and religious issue. The fact is the Western Europe was loaded with Arianism everywhere. Right. And that's why you didn't have a reuniting of the Western Roman empire, the way that the Eastern Roman empire was able to stay together and you know continue forward yeah thank god for novograd because that principality came uh and played a crucial role mm -hmm. in defending from the mongols and you're you're so right after that that i mean that really is the beginning of the the russian empire ivan what's your thoughts on uh everything I including yeah. I, i'd love to everything that he was mentioning about uh the unification of the uh spanish people central south america what what's your thoughts on everything that jose just laid out yeah well, there are two things to point out when it comes to um, Latin America and the relationship with, with Hispanidad, which is that you have to take into account the Freemasons, you have to take into account um, other countries such as England, France, and even Italy. So what happened uh, with Latin America was that when the Freemasons came here, like they had two different plans, for one for Europe and one for America. Uh, for Europe, they wanted unification. So, for example, you had Giuseppe Garibaldi, which was a, like a Freemasonic figure that wanted to uh, unify Italy. This, this was a time where, uh, let's say, politologists, uh, political thinkers were thinking about what makes the state a one solid thing. So you have a, a tendency from that point forward where, uh, let's say, European thought is very uh, focused with the idea of the state so for example you can see it even in hegel like the idea of the total state is like 
the the total idea what makes a state one thing you you see it on, in different like threads but the problem was what do we do with latin america because if latin america was one big state then it could rival like europe because in terms of natural resources it had so many natural resources that it could become a an, a, a hegemon in itself mm -hmm. so what the freemasons wanted to do was to split latin america in different countries and they thought it would be for the best because then those small countries would be ruled from europe now two different things happened first of all like they didn't realize that their values were so mistaken that they would eventually um, lead to the situation where where latin america is right now where latin america is both looking to the u.s it's also looking to its like native past romanticizing its native past which is a very uh, wrong way of, of viewing things and it also has this uh, let's say small uh, um, vein of catholicism still streaking through its veins now the issue for me when i see someone like bukele is that i see someone who uh, likes to he he's part of the new right in the in the philosophical sense he wants to yes he's a strong man yes he wants to let's say he's ambitious and he likes some of uh let's say the the cultural aspects of the the conservative cultural aspects of christianity but mm -hmm. i think that he he models himself more like a let's say like a in in a he's more of a TikTok ruler in a sense he's he's he wants to be a uh, liked a uh, and he wants to be respected and he wants to like in a sense he he is tainted by the by the uh, for example by the um, idea of being liked for being like a strong guy like when I mean, he's so a millennial like, right he's in his later 30s yeah, yeah. so in in that sense I, i'd say that bukele has the problem of um wanting to have it all he wants to be in a sense like a he looks up to donald trump for example and a, in that sense i think he he runs the same problem with all the modern rulers which is they still have to pay lip service to democracy or to neoliberalism and they don't have enough of a leeway to stray from that line so in the sense he he might be a strong man but at the same time he plays the role of jester in the same way like Millet does uh, even yeah, though I late, might find yeah. him, boy has he been disappointing right yeah well the, the dude is exactly what he says he is he's an <laughs> uh, anarcho-capitalist yeah. like and he's he's completely convinced that that is the way and he even frames it in a in a religious way he thinks he's moses like bringing argentina out of the desert of uh <laughs> a socialism so um he's basically making the country into a puppet state of the u.s and uh okay that's that's his prerogative but the question is why did the people vote him because and this is a, a sociological or cultural thing which is like the right wingers they're the left of a couple of years ago like right. classical liberals have gone way way progressive and they don't care so in Millet may, might have a, a let's say a more conservative-ish uh, rhetoric but deep down, like he's full on sexual liberation. He doesn't right. care about those things. And he doesn't have the, let, let's say, the wherewithal to, to do anything about it. He's a neocon, like a, he wants to become Jewish, the whole, <laughs> the whole shebang. And I see Bukele in the, same, a, in the same light. And I see this as a problem within the framing of the new right. Because the new right is a, is a, is a new political movement. It started that about 60 years ago or so or a, a little bit more than that and the the idea here is it's a, it's a sort of like fake conservatism conservatism but with a more traditionalist folks event bent in the sense that the, the new the new right will always speak like for example in spain vox uh, which is the ultra right-wing party if you if you listen to vox for example they're basically classical liberals with a slight not nod to uh, folk culture. So they say they want to protect, I don't know, agriculture and such and this and that. But in the end, they end up serving NATO. So th this is like this is the line that I think Bukele uh, goes for in the yeah. sense that he needs still to 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 um, speak to his base he's not an independent ruler that sets the agenda he's basically 
an extension of democracy in a sense. Right. And in connecting both your and Jose's points, I think something that I glean from both of them is whether it be Bukele or Malay or Donald Trump, because they don't have a religious foundation to ultimately stand on, they're always going to be uh, succumb to the neoliberal worldview because in a way that is the foundation they stand on. You have to have that transcendent relationship with Christ and God for you to be have the courage and the wherewithal and the spiritual discernment to make these decisions and kind of separate yourself. And so, as Jose mentioned, with Bukele being a sort of nominal Christian, if you will, um, and then Donald Trump certainly in that same camp, and Malay, uh, I mean, he's clearly he he's an occultist. He's very open about it. So it's like it makes sense. Again, it comes back to, and, and I don't know Putin's heart. But it is very interesting to see a striking difference between the way Putin's operating in the world and some of these other Westerners where, at least from an outside perspective, again, don't know his sincerity, don't know his heart, but he is a self-professing Orthodox Christian. He does attend services. He has um, elevated the Orthodox Church and given them more power in society. It makes you think that, again, there's something there in regard to the spiritual fight with everything. And it's a thing to take into account. I mean, even, I mean, Americans can learn from this too, because when you, because you're going to get strong men in America. I mean, frankly, even like you know, the fact is Abbott and you know in Texas as well as uh, what's his name in Florida? Um, Mine's blanking on his name. Um, Dead to yeah, the world. No, no, the uh, the the governor. It's Antis. Antis. Yeah, these are guys who are trying to position position themselves as strong men. Um, you know, they or at least an American equivalent. Uh, I'll note that. You know, and typically in, in American machine politics, uh, the people who really wield the power try to rule from, for, quote unquote, the shadows. It's not really that shadows because you can find them, you know, like Maine with the Irving family. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to spot if you know what to look for or if you start recognizing the patterns of how a republic actually functions. Um, the but yeah, but the thing is like, OK, let's say like you do get a strong man in, in Texas or, or Indiana or you know, you know, in Idaho, what have you, and you get, you get a, you know, right wing strong man, like you're, but if the, if the spiritual problem is not solved, the best case scenario you get is a Franco or a Salazar, where you have someone who's able to, uh, a strong man enough who can prevent the decay, uh, and even reverse it back for a bit, for a while, for a few decades. Um, but the fact is, if you don't have that spiritual strength there, and Franco was a very religious man, as was Salazar, and they were both very firmly rooted in, 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 in their Catholicism. And the fact is, uh, their Catholicism was incapable of standing against neoliberalism. And of course, both were undercut by uh, the Vatican, which, you know, it's, I put it as one of the trails of the Vatican for, for Spain, um, how, you know, Franco wanted to restore the monarchy and uh, the, the Vatican was not going to back that. So Franco understood the end game of what it would take to have a stable Spain. He himself, you know, he, he did make mistakes, um, you know, and, you know, it, there's a reason why, you know, Catalan is the way that they are. And that, that involves some of those mistakes that he made uh, that that I consider to be, you know, and his, but his mistakes came from abandoning, you know, you know, the, the, the Spanish tradition of fueros, which is I don't want to start a whole thread on that. But, you know, that's that's the fundamental issue. If, if the spiritual problem is not solved, anything that happens is just a band aid and you're getting yourself a brief respite until things go really crazy again. And the fact is um, what I see, like in terms of since we brought up Putin, uh, Putin has avoided a lot of mistakes of previous people who've tried to fight against neoliberalism. He's avoided the mistake of Bismarck. He's avoided the mistakes of Franco. Um, like he, that's actually the big point. Like he, he avoided all the, the, the big mistake that Franco made, uh, Putin is actively not followed. And uh, given that the, so the, the three, like if you want to understand Putin's mind, talking about reading good books, the, granted these are more philosophical. So the three men, the three men that uh, Putin quotes the most, and frankly, his, really shaped his thinking in terms of, uh, you know, political thinking. Um, so one is Ivan Ilyin, you know, who wrote, you know, mm -hmm. on, on the resistance of evil by force. I have that over here. Yeah. Uh, Vladimir Solovyov, who's actually the character of Yosha in, in Brothers Karamazov, is a one-to-one -one based off of Vladimir uh, Solovyov. So that's the second guy that Putin reads a lot. And the third is um, Nikolai uh, Berdeyev. Berdeyev. Oh, yeah. well, he, he had some wild transhumanist views. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to do a stream on him because a lot of Orthodox aren't familiar with him. And mm -hmm. 
he, yeah. When again, do, with all my academic research with transhumanism, you're you'd be blown away by how often they refer back to him or cite aspects of his writing for his mm -hmm. belief in the sort of utilization of technology to attain immortality as part of his orthodox theosis. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, quit it. anyway, didn't mean to direct. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, it's Sorry. true. Yeah, and Berdeva, that would be the third, 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 the the, the lowest. I mean, Ivan Ilyin is the most solid, and Islovio is also pretty solid. I mean. At least, I mean, granted, I've not read most of what their stuff is written because they're, you know, it's in Russian. Um, I, I do hope to read On Monarchy by uh, Ilian at some point. I have to see if it's been translated in English or not. But, um, but yeah, but that's that's something that's on my, uh, I want to read before I'm dead. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, but that, that's the other part too. Like if you want to understand another culture or even a leadership, you got to understand who forms their thinking. Like in the case of Putin, so I, Ivan Ilian was buried in Switzerland. He was exiled, of course, you know, by the, by the, um, by the, the Reds. And then... Right. He was exiled by uh, mean Mr. Must mustache man in Germany uh, because it's interesting. They, they try to portray him as a, you know, uh, a naughty sock guy. But the fact is he hated um, naughty sockism. Um, he was when initially when, 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 when the brown shirts first appeared, he was wondering, he did write, like he was wondering like, would this be a, a viable response to, to the threat of us, uh, of, uh, of Bolshevism? Uh, but he wholly sale rejected it. And that's why he got exiled. Uh, from from uh, from Germany. If he had stayed, he would have been killed. Um, but yeah, so he was buried in Switzerland, and he always wanted to be buried. Specific, I think it was a specific a specific church he wanted to be buried at in 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 Russia. And Vladimir Putin, I think it was I don't remember if it was two thousand seven or two thousand eight. Flew to Switzerland, uh, retrieved his body, brought him on his own plane, brought him back to Russia. His body or his remains back to Russia, and buried him where he wanted to be buried. And uh, you know, Putin used the shovel himself. So that wow. just to get an idea of how much that man influenced Putin. So you have this whole thing in the West. This is again why you don't pay attention to media. Yeah. Um, people pay attention to media think that Dugan is, Alexander Dugan is some guy who's like immense influence in the Kremlin. Uh, he doesn't matter. So <laughs> in terms of like how these people think, but if you're someone who reads a lot instead and doesn't consume the false, you know, false narratives that are all pushed, then you'd be like, oh, so this Ivan Ilian guy is like, you know, for lack of a better term, he is what, what people think Dugan is. That's what Ivan Ilian actually is to, to Putin. Right. So, yeah. Like, so, well, sure. well, well, I do. I'm sorry if, if there's echo. No, you're um, good. While I, while I do um, agree with your last point that uh, he, uh, Putin is more influenced by Ivan Ilin, uh, I would I would say that uh, it, Dugan is not uh, completely out of the loop in the sense that Dugan's um, noomakia, his mm -hmm. spiritual war, his main concept is very in line with what uh, the new right believes. I don't know if you know Alain Benoit, who is a French uh, intellectual who founded the new the the new right movement. Basically, the problem the, the new right also includes uh, like thinkers like Genon and such like the perennialists. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, like a right wing perennialist view that has a lot of uh, similar traits as postmodernism, and I think they do postmodernism better than postmoderns themselves but the problem is it doesn't ever um gel into something solid so mm -hmm. um they get they they make these um very interesting figures like trump for example because trump let, let's admit it he was a very interesting figure who in the end end up like not panning out at least to 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 what a uh, Orthodox people would want uh, in their leaders, and my criticism of Putin would be something like he he is so enthralled with his own like geopolitical machinations that he doesn't see that the 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 problem with uh, being so let's say light on on Islam, because uh, for example Russia has a fifteen percent population which is Muslim, and a uh, like an Orthodox ruler would clearly have to. Um, in my perspective, intervene and and stop that and make it more difficult for Islam to to um, let's say proliferate. But and I think that that's like one of the the issues with these kinds of figures. And there's a very strong link between let's say figures like Putin and and this new right. And there is like they share a same kind of vibe in the sense that they're all nationalists and they want the best for the country. And they have like an esoteric mystical aspect and they don't deny religion and they're 
let's say they're allies against modernity in a sense and against postmodernity in its more let's say absolute destructive sense but i think they end up going too far in the sense that for example if you take the ideas of dugan even if dugan is not directly influencing putin the ideas that do Dug that dugan uh, expresses these ideas like even if you look at the symbol that he that he has on his book that is this dot that is like uh, trying to expand is this idea of multiculturalism recapitulated so um even when you listen to putin speak like when he criticizes the us he's always saying like why should the us uh, determine the world like we have we are so we're a sovereign nation and we should be able to do the same thing and they try to and then putin in a way and the people who think like him try to elicit sympathy from other countries and this is basically the the dialectic back and forth because other mm -hmm. countries listen to that hear that and say well look i, I want to be sovereign a sovereign nation too but the problem with that is that it leads to me from from my perspective uh, to cultural relativism and a uh, that's a question that that I would pose to to other orthodox thinkers who are interested in geopolitics in the sense of uh, is it legitimate because uh, from my perspective legitimacy uh, comes from God so, and and you mentioned something before Jose that had to do with the the relationship between religion and the effectiveness of a ruler or, or their capacity to rule well and I think that there are two things two sides uh, of this issue one is that a religion has a, 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 a an ethnic component which doesn't mean genetic which means like it creates a people and then the the, the second aspect is that re religion actually um has the ability to make you look forward into the future so um it lets new generations continue within the same let's say same a, vision yeah, same vision. So anyway, that those are were my my two points, and I, I wanted to know what you guys thought about that. Mm -hmm. So one one thing I'll point out is, um, so I look like he, so Putin's pol policy so far in terms of handling the Islamic population, well, not exactly. It is a callback to to Tsarist Russia, like in the sense that you know you can you can hold to the uh, you can hold to the religion of your fathers, or you know you there, but also you know the church is free to set up uh, missions, etc. Like that's why, like for example, a third of the Tartars. Are Christian, and I think like a sixth or a fifth of the, of the Bashkirs are, or Bashkirs are Christian, and then you have you know uh, various uh, um, Siberian groups like the Chuvash who are like 100% Christian, uh, Orthodox Christian. So it's um, yeah. One, one thing I'll point out is there's how how like the Spanish Empire how it handled how it handled uh, you know minorities, the tribes, etc. Russia is closer to that model than compared to the American. Um, one thing I'll point out though, like it's not like uh, of course, so one, the person who put your critique best, of course, would be like, you know, martyr Danny Sosoyev, who had uh, his critique of Putin was that Putin was focusing too much on the material well-being of Russia and not on the spiritual well-being of Russia, uh, which is a very valid, you know, critique. Um, so like if you want to read a, a critic of Putin who actually knows what he's talking about, who actually had some insight in what he's talking about, that you know, martyr Danny Sosoyev would be the one to read. Um Another aspect too, and just this back, just one step back is if you want to understand more of um, Putin's, uh, you know, spiritual status, uh, one can also you can look into the guy that or the man that he's entrusted his soul with. You can you can read his father confessor who wrote the book uh, Lives of Everyday Saints. So that's just something for the, the chat if you want to read something if you want to get a picture of um, the man that uh, Putin <laughs> trusts as his father confessor. Um, but, um, yeah, in terms of like Islam within, I know, like, for example, like, for example, like the, the Bashkirs, I don't remember the exact name, but they follow a sect of Islam that actually forbids, uh, that forbids, uh, uh has always forbidden, um, polygamy. So the thing with Islam is Islam is, is highly divided and with how Russia handles, uh, it is Islamic population, uh, like the Tartars, the English, the Chechens, the, the Bashkirs, they all followed, you know, different, different branches of, you know, of, of Sunni Islam. So they're not united in, you know, they're not united in the sense of like what the United States was trying to engineer with uniting people via Wahhabism with their, you know, puppets of Al Qaeda, Al Nusra, ISIS, etc. So there's an element of if, if they do hold to the, if, if these individual people groups hold to the faith of their fathers, then these Islamic groups are divided, um, you know, in terms of how they like in terms of how they actually live. Um, and that's the other part, too, like you can't the thing with it too is like okay let's assume like you know the czars come back etc 
you can't force a people to convert. Um, it's orthodoxy in particular. It's something that is lived and it's something that the people themselves have to actually live. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and that's something that's just going to take time. I mean, up, up until the Soviet union, uh, you know, came to be and the Bolsheviks interrupted the evangelization that was happening, you know, like as mentioned before, a third of the Tartars had a, you know, converted to orthodoxy. And in, in fact, the, uh, the Tartar language that the Orthodox Tartars speak is no longer mutually intelligible with the, what the Muslim Tartars speak, because, uh, you know, when you become Orthodox, you marry other Orthodox people. So their languages have drifted apart from one another. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, all I'll say is like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not worried about problems that can happen from minorities within Russia, because Russia has a thousand year history, like their imperial history, they have a very, very good track record of handling, uh, of handling minorities in a, in a way that, res- that respects the minorities that live among them, um, as well as, you know, maintaining their, their unitary state. And that's something that frankly, you know, America is absolutely horrendous at right. uh, in comparison. I don't know if you mentioned it, Jose, cause I had to use the restroom real quick, but I, I was going to, uh, add to what Ivan was saying in regards to, I think that's why Putin is trying to offer incentives for the Russian people to have more children because he Mm -hmm. sees the population problem with the Muslim communities because, you know, Chechnya or wherever you want to point to, uh, they're, they're definitely, uh, filling their replacement rate. And I think that's also why the Patriarch Krill has been speaking out and the Orthodox church is taken much stronger stances in Russia against abortion and that terrible, terrible tradition, which has existed in Russia, especially since the Soviet Union. So Mm -hmm. um, I think he's aware of it. um, But I'll pose a question to you. I mean, as an Orthodox ruler, you know, for example, the Byzantine Empire, I mean, there are Muslims um, within the empire. So um, I'm not I'm just curious, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, what do you think Putin's supposed to do? I, I think out replacing them is ultimately the way to go because, you know, the Chechnyans and various uh, Muslim forces or, or territories within the uh, Russian Federation, some of them are great warriors. And, you know, P- Putin utilizes their loyalty to, to Russia. But I, I'm just curious what your thoughts as an Orthodox Christian and if you were an Orthodox ruler of a modern day state in 2024 i mean do they ex- they do they expel them do they force them to convert what what are your i mean what what what, what would be your solutions i guess yeah. i talked a little bit with ivan about that one i'll let ivan go and then i haven't thought about this too much but my go-to would be i would uh, take their i would remove their places of worship they want to if they want to remain they might convert or they might uh, stop worshiping but like that's what i would stamp out i would stamp out their worship and Mm. if they want to leave so be it i will keep their stuff and if they want to stay they better assimilate Uh, that that, that is more the spanish method it's not how those always mentioned (laughs) although even the spanish they, they they did that in spain they didn't do so that much in the new world in the new world they function more like russia uh but historically like if you look at russia you look at byzantium um, like even like in, in the height of the Byzantine empire, like, you know, they permitted the, the Muslims who would, you know, like the, the merchant class, etc., like the Muslims to have their own mosque in, in Constantinople. So it's, it's a matter of like, I look at how the czars, you know, treated the, the you know, the Bashkirs, the Tartars and others. Uh, it's essentially, you permit, you permit the groups, permit people to maintain the traditions of their fathers. Uh, do not permit the creation of new religions, uh, or new sects. Um, so like something like if Jehovah's witnesses pop up, like immediately start smacking that down, which is something that Russia, you know, Putin does do. Um, and, um, from that point it's just, it's slow and steady, it's slow and steady, uh, evangelization. So the fact is like the territory that we consider the heartland of Russia that was evangelized over a period of 400 years. So like in, in, in the prior to Christopher Columbus, uh, discovering the new world, the fact is, you know, Russia, the, 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 the Constantinople and the Russian in the Russian church evangelized an area the size of Western Europe. Uh, that was the largest right. amount of evangelization that was done uh, during in the post schism period up until Spain started like really carrying the torch for for Rome and Portugal as well. Um, and there's a reason why, for right. example, like you and know, I missed France, the territory. Were you talking about Anatolia? Were you? What, no, no. Can, I'm talking about, talking about like what is now considered the Russian heartland. It's like, Oh, oh yes, yeah. yes, yes. sorry. Sorry. It was evangelized sorry, over, 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 over four and a half centuries. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it was the largest. It was it was it was only exceeded by the Spanish and the Portuguese. And of course, the Spanish and the Portuguese had the advantage of uh, you know imperial conquest and uh, what do you call it? Vastly out out. What do you call it? You know. Also, like Roman. Frankly, Roman Catholicism is something you convert someone to the sword or with the sword. You can't do that with Orthodoxy. So I don't know if you heard the part that I mentioned. Like with the Tartars in particular, they're the largest uh, minority group, and uh, a third, like a third of them, are Orthodox. Uh, at this point, and they were kind of slowly converting to orthodoxy over time, up until you know the, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, so the you know and their languages, the languages of the of the of the uh, Orthodox uh, Tartars and the Muslim Tartars have drifted apart from one another because of um, because of how long that ongoing process has been. Uh, so honestly, I, like that, that's what I would just do 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 what the Russian czars did uh, in the past. Um, you know, let them let them practice the they can practice the ways of their fathers, but the church has the um freedom to to do mission work etc and uh, those who convert cannot be you know cannot be killed and even today the fact is like so the chechens are always a holdout in, in terms of converting to christianity but there actually have been mass baptisms of che mass baptisms of chechens that have been happening over the past decade mm. so well, what about like the dagestanis uh because they have a pretty strong warrior culture uh tied with their islam um uh, mm -hmm. you know anything about I'm less familiar with them. So. Okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I know the UFC fighters that uh, uh, yep. uh, kind of incredible the amount of uh, high level uh, UFC athletes that they've put forth for such a small country. Mm -hmm. It's like yep. the Georgians in arm wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Georgians are dominate arm wrestling. It's crazy. Along with and then the Russians and there's people all over the world, but number one in the world is uh levon from uh georgia sorry i digress no no problem but it's even like you see with the buddhist population so you know like the tuvans are buddhist people and uh what do you call it you know shoigu is like the most famous tuvan now and uh you know his, his father was the convert to orthodoxy uh, shoigu was actually raised in the faith mm. so it's um it's the thing is conversion to orthodoxy it takes patience it took three centuries to convert the roman empire um you know and even then it was still like there was still a lot of work to be done when when Constantine, you know, when when Constantine, you know, uh, liber, you know, ceased pers the persecution of the church, and even when Saint Theodosius made Christianity the state religion, and there are problems of when you start uh, using the sword to enforce things, because the fact is um, the Monophysites uh, essentially didn't see any interest in opposing the Muslims because of um, the treatment they were getting at the hands of the Byzantine Empire. So in that sense, uh, that's one thing. I, I know there are uh, probably Levantine Orthodox who, who, who disagree in that. You know, I agree. Like there was a lot of things the Byzantine Empire got better than the Russians, but the Russians did learn from the mistake of the of the Byzantine Emperor or, or the, or the Rome, Christian Roman emperors, uh, and they have not had that problem. Um, you know, where you know, for example, like when the Ottomans invaded uh, in during the I think it was was the Crimean War. Yeah, it was the Crimean War. The Ottomans invaded and they thought they were going to get. Um, like the, the 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 they thought the Tartars were gonna you know assist them, um you know within Russia and then the Tartars fought to the death against uh, the Ottomans because they preferred being under the Tsar than the Caliph, so it's um and, and also because I think the, the the Caliph was gonna force them to adopt a flavor of Islam that they actually didn't historically practice whereas the Tsar would let them practice what their fathers did, so that's another element there because when when you had when, when there's no Caliph now but the Caliph would try to get everyone on his page, um and. Frankly, you know, especially a lot of traditional cultures, you want to do what your father did, mm -hmm. um, and that's something the Tsar permitted, and that's how he won over, you know, Muslims like the Bash, you know, the Bashkirs and the Tartars, uh, and frankly, even the Chechens uh, mm -hmm. in, in the end. Yeah, it's a great point. Just to uh, avoid any clarification, I know we got some. I'm seeing some arm wrestling fans out there. <laughs> I do hope Devin Larratt, uh, the Canadian, uh, does win. I'm I'm very familiar with the world of uh, arm wrestling. Just like to watch the top matches, but if, if he's able to beat Levon, uh, you know, God bless him. That di that dude is ginormous. But anyways, digress. And Robo Lamb was the one that said it, and he threw in a generous twenty dollars super chat earlier, and he said, um, "Giga based stream. Jose should write a book or just start a cult. Either way, he can have all my fiats." <laughs> And then uh, Dennis R. throws in another $20 over on Dono Chat. Thank you very much, Dennis R. He says, great show, David. Tell the guests I said thank you. Thank you, guests. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Jose. Really appreciate you guys always hopping on and sharing your, your perspectives. And 
Jose, you got you got a hell of a repertoire of information, man. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. You always come in and share so many insightful things. One thing I want to point out in the chat, because uh, Julian Suni was saying about in regard to what I said, search for Russia's newest law, no evangelizing outside of the church. So you got to understand well, how Russian up. law works. Uh, so the question is, what actually gets enforced? Russia makes all kinds of laws on the books, but they're not like Americans, where everything on the books is thrown at you. Um, so it's, um, cause Russia is doing, the Russian church is doing evangelizing. And I assure you, uh, none of the, none of the priests doing evangelizing are going to be getting, uh, thrown, um, uh, or getting prosecuted underneath that law. However, Jehovah's witnesses will be. So that's the thing you got to understand, like culture, other cultures are different than your culture in their relationship with how law functions. And that's part of the problem in the United States with this mass immigration that's happening because I can tell you, like, an Hispanic's relationship with the law is different than uh, an American's relationship with how law should function. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll say that, uh, like, in the in the Russian purview, um, what matters more is the judge than, than what the books say. So it's just something to take into account. Like, other cultures are different and, you know, weird. The Western experience is really different. So it, it's the one careful of, like, I see, like, for example, um, you know, in, in Mediterranean cultures specifically, uh, you know, the Levant, uh, you have this huge uh, thing, you know, they, they well, in the West, we call it, we, in, in America and Britain, we call it exaggeration. Um, but like, literally, if you've, you've ever had done business with, with uh, you know, Syrians uh, or Lebanese, like they can, you know, one second, uh, they're, you know, they're telling you, um, you know, I'm going to exterminate your whole family line and the next second, your buddies. So it's just something to take into account. You know, it, don't, don't take what you see at face value. And you got to be careful when it comes to evaluating another culture, don't try to impart your own norms onto that culture like there will be parallels like there are parallels between bushido and you know christendom's uh you know knighthood but right. uh you know they're very different in terms of you know, you know even though there are a few parallels they're radically different in terms of right. how they I, I think that's a problem with them but just modern people generally speaking they're and perennialism as a presupposition people maybe haven't even articulated or even consciously thought about but always trying to like overly emphasize similarities to say oh look it's mm -hmm. the same thing it's that's yeah. that's the simplistic thinking that is that is dangerous and there's so many pitfalls when you approach topics that way so exactly you can always notice the similarities but there's always differences and mm -hmm. and it's a it's almost more important to know the differences than the similarities yep and it's like even like for example people say like oh um you know putin passed a law which you know what do you call it um will imprison you if you deny you know deny certain events in the 1940s well, look at how actually it's applied. Uh, who are the people who actually get the book thrown at them? People who deny that the, um, and the well, the German regime um, mur murdered uh, more than 17 million, you know, USSR civilians. Right. So, and, and, thing. and that's why he always brings up the, the Nazi rhetoric when he's talking about Ukraine and some of the stuff happening I, because of that. His, I mean, maybe you disagree, but I think it is certainly playing with many of the boomers uh, within Russia that that's still um probably more so appreciate that history and that that angle on who the good guys and the bad guys were in world war ii mm -hmm. it doesn't just hit their boomer generation it hits their younger generations too it, is um, it i'm not i'm not as familiar with uh, how the younger generation views that stuff yeah like all, all the younger russians that i know and even younger ukrainians i know they, they it, it hits them one way or the other it, it hits them pretty it's it's very uh yeah it is definitely very hard-hitting rhetoric within 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 the russian and ukrainian speaking uh, sphere across all generations and that's the other thing too they don't have their generational divides are a little different than the u.s because one thing you got to take into account the, the reason why the u.s has such stark generational divides is because in the united states everything the emphasis is popular culture and which is which is a descendant from the enlightenment emphasis on national culture national and popular culture are horizontal folk culture is vertical in the united states uh, the, the rulership class is essentially done their best to destroy folk culture everywhere and anywhere. Like there's a reason why, you know, the, the you know, backwoods of, uh, of, uh, West Virginia, that population is looked down upon so much because they are a, one of the few folk cultures within the United States that is holding tooth and claw onto their folk culture. Um, and anyway, that's just, that's just something to, to, to consider. Yeah. It's a great point. Well, guys, I gotta go. Yeah. Well, we're getting ready to wrap it up. So yeah. God bless you, brother. Thanks for hopping on. I appreciate you, man. God bless you and the family and hope to see you again in, in the near future. You're yeah, in Spain. You you're in Good you're night. in Spain right now. Are you still yeah. in Spain? Yeah. Yeah. All right. God bless, brother. Take it easy.
All right, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, looked like a lot of people got a conversation going in the chat. Um, I just want to give a special thanks to all the supporters over on Dono Chat, Dennis R., Robo Lamb, Patrick, Dennis R. again. Thank you so much, Dennis R. and Blue Skittle. I want to give a special thank you to Rachel Wilson for renewing her 12-month Codal Crew membership along with Son of Clay becoming a Codal Crew member. And thank you very much, Raven Wisdom, for your generous super chat. Do appreciate it. Um, Jose, any thoughts about anything that we discussed today that you would like to clarify or or reinforce or leave the people with? Um, yep. the, the topic was the Russian terrorist attack and geopolitics. Feel free. Yeah, uh, just um, this shows the limits so, uh, from the topic that it started with. This shows the limits of narrative control versus uh, power. Well, narrative power, the power of narrative versus the power of real life. So America deals in um, America deals in in influence, and now it's got the punch in the it's got punch in the face by re, by real power in reality. So that's the essentially America is discovering the limits of influence compared to power. There is a scene in Game of Thrones, which as awful as that series, uh, well the books I, you know are there is actually one scene in the books that they did do the film in, and there's a clip of it on YouTube that I do recommend. And it is power versus influence. And that was mm. the one thing like ignore everything else of, of that series. But that was the one scene that was brilliantly, it was very well written and it shows the, inf the money power. Cause it's literally the character who's the banker and controls the treasury versus uh, the queen. And uh, he discovers the limits of his influence with money when he gets uh, a sword, you know, pulled to his throat uh, and real power when you have real military power, because that's what you're having right now. The conflict, right at this level of uh you know we're looking at the geopolitical level not at the spiritual at, at this point but what you have is you have the banking power of the west that is fighting with the real military power of the east right and uh influence is, is there's a lot you can do with influence but uh at the end of the day um money doesn't turn into artillery shells uh, <laughs> that's just reality. true and the one last thing I want to clarify was that very yeah. last point I was saying, I remembered, and I want to make it more clear, the reason why you have such generational divides in the West, in the United States in particular, compared to Russia, is Russia has intact, not just an intact national culture and a religious uh, religious revival of a, of a national faith, but they also have intact folk cultures. And so True. where you have intact folk cultures, that is identity through time. That is what bonds a child with a father, with a grandfather, with a great grandfather. I'm from here, you know, like, you know, uh, Orenburg and, you know, this is my father's from and my grandfather's from it. And we do things this way. We have our dishes like this compared to how they do it in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Um, that is something you'd see all throughout the United States in the 19th century. And that is something that's the uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the ruling class of America has sought to destroy, because right. if you if you want to engineer people, which is, you know, a whole transhumanism thing talking about today, if, if you want to engineer people, you have to make them moldable. You have to destroy their folk culture. Right. And one of the consequences of destroying folk culture is you break the bonds between the generations. And when popular culture becomes all that there is, people are identifying based on what music they were listening to in high school. And that's why you get Stairway to Heaven exactly. played forever as number one on, on, you know, rock radio forever because of the boomers still reminiscing over what they heard in high school. <laughs> So that's why you have such a breakdown. And if you yeah. don't want to have that generational divide with your own children, of course, you know, get the faith right. Right. Uh, that, that's primer, primer uno, you know, the cult, get the cult right. And then get folk culture. Like, yes, you know, I, I understand the despair uh, many or the, the concern many Americans have about being, you know, the deracination that's going on. But uh, the issue is, what do you call it? It's insufficient to just teach your kids to be, you know, American or even in the case where I'm to teach them to be Texan. Like you want to contribute and build in, in local folk culture that your kids identify with so that they have a bond to where they are, the town that they're in, the city that they're in, um, you know, the, the part of Texas that they're in. You know, is it is it German Texas? Is it, you know, the Hanoland? Is it, uh, you know, uh, Scotch, you know, the Scotch Irish out near Texarkana? You know, that that's that's something you want to give to your kids. Like, what is the folk culture you're going to give them? Yep. That's a, that's a great point. And, you know, like you mentioned that the American establishment has done everything they can to eradicate folk culture. And now people identify based whatever their sexual orientation is or whatever brands they purchase, just like the whole Supreme thing, like people paying outrageous amounts of money to wear a brand that just has Supreme on it. I mean, what a total psyop, mm -hmm. but it shows you the lack of, um, 
identity and that America, unfortunately, for many people that aren't rooted on, on anything, comes back to that religious foundation we talked about earlier, the true cornerstone, that they are, they are, their identity is what they consume. And that can be, I'm a vegan. That's my identity. Uh, I listen to metal music or I'm a, I listen to hip hop or in it's, it's such a de degradation of humanity and, and they totally are malleable. And I think anybody that's in this country, as I know you are, um, can see that. And the last remnants of any sort of hope is the few places in this country that still have a little bit of some sort of historical identity, although it's much more shallow than other places in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Jose, God bless you and the family, man. Thank you so much for hopping on. And I will be back uh, later this week to talk about Nishitani and his philosophy of uh, blending Zen Buddhism with German phenomenology. We'll be discussing Heidegger, We'll, do, we'll be discussing Nietzsche. He's also influenced by Nietzsche and Sartre. So it'll be a very philosophical discussion. Major thank you to AC for sponsoring that. Uh, so I will see you guys next time. Thank you again, Jose. And as always, until then, God bless.